they provide they provide critically important ecosystem services and socio-economic benefits. Without vultures, these reeking characteristics would stay in the environment longer, would lead to infestation and maybe even spread of diseases. Now, having said that, we'd like to begin this event and I'd like to call upon the dignitaries to the stage and uh, please take a seat on the stage and... We have our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor G. Hemant Kumar. We have uh, Mr. Yadu Kondalu, IFS Officer from the Karnataka Policy Department, and Mr. Uh, Devraju, uh, again, Officer of the Karnataka Policy Department, and uh, the Professor Malini, Chairman of the Department of Studies and Education Genomics. To begin this event, I'd like to call upon uh, Ms. Manon Mai to have an invocation song for all of us. Jaya Jaya He Bhagavati Surabharati Tavacharanam Jaya Jaya He Bhagavati Surabharati Tavacharanam Pranamayahu Nada Brahmai Jaya Vageshwari Nada Brahmai Jaya Vageshwari Charanam Te Gachama Jaya Jaya He Bhagavati Surabharati Tava Charanam Pranamayam Tvavasi Sharanya Tribhuvanananya Tvavasi Sharanya Tribhuvanananya Sura Muni Vandita Charana Navara Samadhura Kapila Mukhara Navara Samadhura Kapila Mukhara Smita Ruchi Ruchi Rabharana Jaya Jaya De Bhagavati Sura Bharati Tavacharanam pranamayam Asina bhava manasaham se Kundatu dhina shashi dhavare Harajadatu guru panilidasam Sita panta jatanu vimare Jaya jaya he Bhagavati Surabharati Tavacharana Thank you, Ms. Manonai. Uh, she's a student of the MSc Genetics final year. Uh, now I'd like to call upon Professor Malini to the podium to further welcome the gathering and also uh, give a brief description about this project and the work that is going to happen. A very good morning to all of you. A warm welcome to all the dignitaries on the dais and off the dais, um, colleagues, students, research scholars, non-teaching staff, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome all the gathering, all the dignitaries. And it's a milestone moment in the end of Department of Genetics and Genomics. And MOU is being signed by Karnataka Forest Department and Department of Genetics and Genomics for the research on vultures. Conducting research both in orthodox and contemporary genetics, department is known for that, 
and research excellence has continued unabated in the department through the years of Drosophila and human genetics work. Many international collaboration research were initiated and groundbreaking research work is being carried out in the field of population genetics, evolutionary genetics, human genetics, genomics, including genetic disorders and bioinformatics, genetic engineering of microbes, pathogenicity of diseases, and drug development. Several award-winning research papers were published from the department by many group of researchers in the field who were guided by eminent teachers both from the parental department and as well as from the genetics department. And in view of this, department has taken up this uh, project. And as we know, vultures are an integral part of our ecosystem. And nine species of vultures can be found in India, but most of them are now in danger of extinction after a rapid and uh, major population collapses in the recent decades. In the early 1980s, three species of these vultures were found. They have compiled estimated population of these of is around 30 million in South Africa and South Asia. But as of now, in 2017, the total population numbered 19,000 as per the data available. Now, major contributing factor for this decline of vulture is believed to be the widespread usage of the drug, such as the detrochinic, uh, which has been used as the anti-inflammatory drug in the livestock. And other than that, there is a habitat destruction and uh, pollution, all these are contributing for the declination of this vulture population. The IUCN Red Data Book has listed uh, Bengalensis as a critical endangered species. Uh, as you know, the dramatic vulture declination observed across India, and there are many other uh, animals are contributing to this. Increased feral dogs population uh, has been reported throughout the India, and that increases the incidence of rabies cases. And also, uh, as you know, there's a shortage of uh, anti rabies vaccine in the rural area can aggravate the problem even further. Other than this, increased crow population at Takasa site near the settlement area also poses risk of infection to poultry, domesticated birds, and humans. So, vultures are a major integral part of our ecosystem. And here they are the one, in, despite feeding on the infected carcasses, they are not infected because the acid in their stomach that will disinfect uh, the pathogen which uh, has been uh, fed. And the bird also prevents the contamination of water sources, especially in the wild, when the animal dies near the water hole in the forest. And this will clear the contamination. So, with all this, Vultures are not sexually dimorphic and uh, males and females cannot be easily identified. In, in view of this, all these points, uh, DNA testing or genetic analysis is very much required in this context. And by taking the fecal matter or the feather, such things, we can do uh, DNA analysis. Realizing the entire thing, the role of the vulture in our food chain, Department of Studies in Genetics and Genomics uh, will, is uh, willing to have a memo with the Department of uh, the Government of Karnataka is posing established vulture genome and variation studies, its conservation, and we wanted to establish vulture gene bank. Other than that, even we wanted to, department wanted to conduct training program for forest efficient in wildlife conservation, such as uh, starting from DNA isolation, PCR, RT-PCR, cytogenetic analysis, sequencing, uh, phylogenetic analysis, exome data analysis, all these things. And we want to uh, highlight the importance of wildlife species, especially the vulture, and uh, to create a genome database and also uh, to control the diseases with uh, further information. With this preamble, uh, I take this opportunity and it's a great pleasure for me to invite all the dignitaries for this auspicious occasion. And first of all, I would like to invite our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, Professor G. Hemant Kumar, sir, a man of visionary great human, a great teacher, and he created a milestone, many first in the campus, and to start, he has started the career hub to support uh, students, and uh, he is very aggressive in bringing out uh, crores of uh, uh, rupees, money from uh, Chinese and the Indian program, and uh, with this constant support, we could able to lot of such activities, 
He has occupied a different position in the department, in the campus. Now he is supporting us as a vice chancellor of this uh, university. And on behalf of all of us from the department and from all the faculty members from the department, heartily welcome to you, sir, for this auspicious occasion. I take a pleasure to invite Dr. Vibhu Prakash Mathur Ji, sir, and he is a deputy director of BNHS, head of Vulture Conservation Program. Sir is in online, and uh, when I requested him, his authority in Vulture Conservation, when I requested him, he uh, agreed and uh, he is uh, coordinating with us. And in future, to uh, have this project, I need your support, uh, Vibhu Prakash, uh, sir. And any queries or any problem, when we end up with any problem, definitely you have to guide us to take up this uh, project in a higher level. And uh, on behalf of University of Mysore, from the Department of Genetics and Genomics, uh, heartily welcome to you, sir. We are all waiting to listen to you. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to invite V. Uh, Devara, uh, Deputy Conservator of Forest, Ramnagar. Uh, and uh, we have a vulture sanctuary in Ramadevara Beta. He's instrumental to bringing this uh, idea and project to the University of Mysore. In future, along with uh, his association, we'll be having many training programs for forest official in uh, uh, educating the, uh, the genetic part of the DNA profiling in conserving wildlife uh, uh, animals. So from uh, department and from the University of Mysore, heartily welcome to you, sir. I request Kaushik uh, to hand over the topic. Thank you, sir. Uh, a dynamic, young, and uh, energetic person, you must be knowing, he is involved, he is motivating all youngsters and doing a lot of uh, social activities. Uh, that is, uh, Edukundu Edu, V, IFS, Deputy Conservator of Forest, Kolega, Chamrajanagar. And uh, you must, if you just go through his uh, Facebook, you will be really wonderful. How much work he is doing. He is uh, sensitizing the entire society, youth, in conserving animals, especially to control pollution, the plastic, clearance of plastic. And uh, really, we are fortunate to have you, uh, sir, today. And uh, after this inaugural program, he will be delivering the talk on uh, that's the application of genetics in wildlife conservation and we need uh, officers like you in future in, in association with you, we'll be doing a lot of genetic analysis. I hope you will extend your support throughout our uh, program. Uh, and uh, we have of University of Mysore, Department of uh, Genetics and Genomics. I request welcome, I welcome uh, Dr. sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. So, here, uh, without the department support, uh, anything, any activity couldn't be done. Our uh, former chairperson, founder of the department, Department of Genetics and Genomics, uh, Professor N.B. Ramachandra, sir, he is my guide, mentor. His constant support and his blessings always towards me. I could able to do all these activities with a lot of hurdles. And always, sir, is with me. His blessings are with me. That is guiding me, supporting me. And uh, on behalf of everyone, I welcome our uh, beloved uh, N.B. Ramachandra sir to this August audience. And seniors of the strength of the department, to Subramanya sir and Amrutwali madam, always they are supporting me, anything they guide me. And for the success of any program from the department, they are with me always. And heartily welcome to uh, them. They are father and mother of the department to me. Parents. So, without the young and the energetic, dynamic faculty in you know, our uh, faculties, uh, nothing could be done. So, I welcome Dr. Tejas, Dr. Pratibha, Dr. Chaitra, Dr. Somana, Dr. Kaushik, Manjuna, all young dynamic uh, faculties to this uh, occasion. And uh, my young minds, my students, they are my strength. Okay, they are always with me, supporting me. I pester them, but still they tolerate me always. So I welcome all of them. Uh, I welcome uh, our senior faculty in the campus, uh, Professor Viva Singh, sir. And all uh, media person, they have given very wide uh, uh, this one, 
Uh, I think and uh, I welcome everyone. I welcome ICD people, media people, and IOE. I welcome one and all for this auspicious occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for uh, welcoming everyone. Uh, but uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Professor Malini uh, to this event. Thank you. Uh, with this, we'd like to move to the next stage. I'd uh, request the dignitaries on stage to light the lamp and uh, officially inaugurate the program. Thank you. Yes, uh, we'd like to announce events I'd like to request the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Raymond Kumar, to address the gathering and give our inaugural speech. Very good morning to you all. I'm really happy today for the MOU that has been signed on the bio diversity of vultures in Ramadevan Petra using DNA profile. This MOU is signed with the Government of Karnataka Forest Department with the University of Mysore. So on this occasion, the tributaries on the Dayas, Vedu Kondalo, IFS Deputy Conservator of Forest, Mr. V. Devrag, Deputy Conservator of Forest, Ram Nagara, and Dr. Vibhu Prakash Mathur, Deputy Director of VHNS, who is online. Organizing Secretary of this uh, program, Professor S. S. Malini, who is also Professor and Chairman of the Genetics, uh, Department of Genetics and the Genomics. And Senior Professors, Professor Neva Singh, Professor Subramanian, Professor N. V. Ramchandra, Professor Andhutvali, and all the other faculties of this uh, department and the faculties of the different departments of these campuses and all the research students and students and particip participants 
of this uh, program and media persons. So this, uh, it gives me immense pleasure to participate this inaugural function of signing the MOU of, of understanding between Department of Studies in Genetic Genomics, University of Mysore and Forest Department, Government of Karnataka to conduct the research in the field of wildlife biology. I'm happy to note that this agreement is a significant milestone in the history of the century old University of Mysore and Department of Studies in Genetics and Genomics. The Department of Studies in Genetics and Genomics has trained young generations and conducted the research in both national and international level in the frontier area of genetics relevant to human health and welfare. The department of, uh, in this department of the University of Mysore has come a longer way over the years, transforming the knowledge of uh, advancement made in modern genetics field to the various uh, segments of the biology. I'm also aware that there is a great relevance of genetics, genetics in the field to the wildlife biology. Coming to this uh, memorandum of understanding while discussing with the chairperson, I came to know that the stability of welfare population is at crossroads and the day has come like the Gatayu will extinct soon. I understand that, that the survival of any animal is due to the gene environmental interaction based on the basic principles of the genetics. Professor Malini in his uh, speech mentioned that they, there are uh, different applications of the knowledge of genetics and genomics can foster progress in understanding diminishing population of cultures. I always appreciate the vibrant activities of this department. So in the campus, in this context, I am confident that the memorandum of agreement assigned today will richly contribute to the diminishing population of the culture in the light of the biodiversity. As a part of the memorandum of understanding, the Department of Genetics and Genomics is also contemplating to organize the lecture series programs to the officers of the Department of uh, Forest, the Department of Forest and Government of Karnataka on the important applications of genetics in the wildlife management. So, as this, uh, as the head of this institution, I am very happy at this uh, for uh, this type of uh, sharing the knowledge from the portals of higher education, which is the need of the hour uh, for, for the all-round development of the universities. I look forward to give the full support and the, as the capacity of Vice Chancellor of University of Mysore for such events. So now government has totally what we call disconnecting with uh, what we call financial matters. So they say that it is university is yours, generate your friends and generate the knowledge and uh, see that you should be always stop at the uh, all, all, all the rankings. So all rankings that we want to get, not only the finance, we need to have what we call good research, good research papers. Therefore, now it is a time to enter into the different MOUs the, where research can be applied to the society, where our research can be what we call brought to the society level through various different agencies of the government and also in DPS. So with this, uh, I must congratulate Professor S.S. Malini uh, the, and the faculties of this department for formulating this project with the Department of uh, Forest. And also I would like to express the, the appreciation of the Chief Conservator of Forest and officers and the Forest Department of Government of Karnataka and the staff of the Genetics and Genomics making this uh, agreement uh, which is a reality and a goodwill and clear ambition and a strong commitment to work together. So with this, always many MOUs uh, are signed and also will be signed. This MOU should give a meaning. Mm -hmm. So it should come out with uh, some results mm -hmm. after the few years or uh, after we must set up some more to call uh, time target to come out of the, what we call some output of the projects. So with this only you can come up. So we, our department, is also university ready to conduct many programs for the forest uh, 
a department of shields in terms of the training them in big videos of technologies available. So with these works, uh, these types of MOU, let it happen and a workable MOU with different departments. So that not only what we call in the, in the, in the prospect of economics, in the prospect of what we call a joint research and also the research which can touch the society. With these words, I would like to what we call conclude my talk as I had to go to some other program. By 11 o'clock, I had to be in what we call Sargo for that, some radio program. Thank you very much. Uh, we would like now to uh, felicitate our guests who have taken time from their busy schedule to be amongst us here. Uh, first up, uh, uh, Mr. Dev Raj, the Deputy Conservator of Forests, Ramnagara, Karnataka Forest Department. Thank you, sir, for being here with us. And now, uh, Mr. Yadu Kondalu, IFS officer and deputy conservator of forests, Chandraj Nagara, Karnataka Forest Department. And uh, finally, a token of appreciation for Professor Hemant Kumar, our honorable vice chancellor. So, our Vice Chancellor has a will be taking our leave. Thank you, sir. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Tejas Baba Kalastawadi to deliver a vote of thanks for this formal function. So at the outset, I'd like to thank our Vice Chancellor, Professor Hemant Kumar for gracing this occasion and supporting the department's endeavor in obtaining an MOU with the Forest Department. I also thank him for addressing the gathering with his thoughtful words. A very big thank you to our invited speaker, Dr. Vibhu Prakash Mathur, for taking the time to participate in this program and address our students. We're all excited and looking forward to listening to your lecture. I would like to thank Mr. Yadukundu and Mr. Dungaraji for their support uh, for the MOU and for gracing this event. I also thank you for addressing the gathering with your talks as well. A very big thank, thank you to all the members of the genetics department who worked hard to put this event together. Thanks to our chairman, Professor Sis Mahan, Professor Paulus, and students. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 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 Ask Kaushik here to come and introduce Dr. Vibhu Prakash Mathur, who will be delivering a talk to us today on uh, vulture conservation in India, issues and strategies. Uh, Dr. Mathur, if you can hear us. Uh... Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sir. Uh, Thank you so just much. a couple of minutes. We'll just give you a brief introduction about you, and then you can have the talk. Sure, yeah, please. Good morning, everyone. It's my privilege to introduce today's uh, invited speaker, Dr. Vibhu Prakash Mathur, who is currently the principal scientist, ornithology, 
at Bombay Natural History Society. Dr. Mathur obtained his doctorate degree from the University of Bombay in the year 1989. His research interests lie in understanding the ecology of wetland dependent grafters at Kiladio National Park, Bharatpur, Rajasthan. Additionally, he was involved in studying the ecology of Siberian and Saurus cranes in Kiladio National Park. He has done extensive work on bird migration in all major wetlands in the country. Since 1984, he has been working on birds of prey, including vultures, and in 1997, he reported the crash in population of gyps vultures in Kiladio National Park. Dr. Mathieu has published in reputed international journals like Biological Conservation, Journal of Zoology, Journal of Applied Ecology, and the Proceedings of Royal Society of London Bulletin. Dr. Mathur is the recipient of the prestigious March Award from United Kingdom for his wildlife conservation efforts in the year 2003. The Royal Bank of Scotland Award for Species Conservation in 2016 and the Prani Mitra Award in 2021 from the Central Zoo Authority, India. Currently, he heads the Vulture Conservation Program of the Bombay National History Society based at Pinjo, Haryana. The project was responsible in setting up four conservation breeding centers for Indian gyps vultures and in parallel monitoring the vulture population and safe zone establishment. He is an independent member of the National Vulture Recovery Committee of Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change and also the member of the Central Zoo Authority. On behalf of the Department of Studies in Genetics and Genomics and the Karnataka Forest Department, I wholeheartedly welcome Dr. Vibhu Prakash Mathur to deliver the invited talk entitled Vulture Conservation in India Issues and Strategies. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning to all of you. I am really grateful to Dr. Malini for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to give this talk and to the University of Mysore. I am really quite excited to address the faculty and the students of Mysore University. So I think I will now share my presentation just a minute and then I will start the talk. Thank you. Can you all see my presentation, please? Can you see the presentation? Sir, we can see this. Okay. Thank you so much. So now I'll start on talking on vultures. And first I will, uh, in my talk, I will just tell you a little bit about vultures and what they are, what role they play in the ecosystem and what actually happened to them and why we really need to save these vultures from extinction and what conservation measures have been taken to save these species from extinction. So, slide So I, my talk will be focused on these three species of vultures, the wrong belt, white backed and slender belt. Although we have nine species of vultures in the country, but these three species form the bulk of the vulture population in the country. They in fact form 99% of what the vulture populations are. And, the, the, and these three species really suffered a crash in their population during the last couple of decades. So I will be concentrating more on these three species. So vultures are raptors, but now they have evolved for scavenging. I don't think there is any other uh, species in the animal world which is as efficient a scavenger as vultures are. So vultures, they never have a kill, but they feed on dead meat. They feed, they feed exactly on the same kind of meat as other scavengers and predators like uh, the mammalian uh, predators like tiger, leopards, hyenas and all but they don't kill. But vultures, since they have evolved for uh, scavenging, they can eat almost as much, uh, almost 40 to 50% of the body weight in one go if there's a food abundance. 
unlike other predators and scavengers who can eat only 5% of the body weight in uh, in a day but, uh, apart from that vultures are very efficient they are uh, uh, they can move uh, hundreds of kilometer a day in search of food whereas mammalian predators are restricted by movement they can just move a, a few kilometers and vultures since they have evolved for scavenging they have they can eat very fast vultures fly in uh, you know the way they search for food that they they are all social birds so they always fly in flocks and since they they are large and big birds but once they get onto the thermals they don't have to spend energy they just float on thermals and can travel hundreds of kilometers without without spending energy they can fly as fast as 100 kilometers an hour so uh, what the vultures do when they are flying in the sky they keep an eye in on each other as well as on other scavengers mammalian scavengers on the ground and if one of them locates uh, it finds that the uh, scavengers are going in one direction it will come down a bit and uh, investigate and if it locates a carcass it will not come down immediately but it will start taking tight circles thereby it will advertise to the other kinds floating the sky that come there is food so vulture so it has a cascading effect and vultures from hundreds of kilometers come there feed and go back and you know a dead body is virtually a culture medium of bacteria and fungus so as soon as death takes place fungus and bacteria start multiplying and once they form spores they are almost immortal and uh, they go into the soil and water and then there's a spread disease as you all know what happens but vultures since they are efficient scavengers they can reach uh, the places quickly and they can finish food fast so they finish up carcasses before the bacteria and fungus can actually grow into it and they have a very acidic uh, digestive tract they have a ph of uh, one or two in uh, in the guts so they can digest pr pr practically everything which goes in there so without they getting infected so the vultures uh, were very common in our country and you know when we say it's very common it's very difficult to imagine now how common they used to be we have an estimated population of about 40 million birds in the country and you know this picture is taken in delhi in a uh, early 80s and you will see every inch of space in this picture is occupied by vultures and this is a carcass waste dump just in the heart of delhi and you will also notice that there is a housing colony just behind that but there was no stench what is actual stench is bacterial and fungal action on the organic matter that's called stench but vultures are so efficient scavengers that they will feed up everything and there will be hardly anything uh, for the bacteria and fungus to feed on, so there won't be any stench, and the people would not find a difficulty in staying in such places. But now vultures are all gone, and uh, we have very few vultures left. And now we'll tell you what happened to them. So vultures were playing a very important role in the Indian society, in the, in the Indian environment. You know, we have a sec, a class, a section of people. Who earned their living by collecting hide and bone from the dead animals, and they will the, the bones were searched for gelatin gelatin industries and leather for the and the hide for the leather industries. What would happen is these uh, these guys would actually follow vultures. So they will look at vultures wherever they are circling, and whenever they notice that the vulture is circling at one place, they will go. There and sure enough, they will find a carcass. So they will quickly start skinning it. And before they could finish skinning, the vultures will come and start feeding on it. So these guys will take the skin, wait for the vultures to finish the carcass, the meat and all, and then they will collect the bones. But what happens now is there are no vultures. And by the, the time they locate carcasses, the carcasses are eaten up by dogs. They damage the hide and all. And these guys, they suffer. They, they have really suffered in their business. Similarly, we have a community of Parsis where vultures played a very important role in their last rites because Parsis, they consider death to be an act of shaitan. So whenever a person dies, the body is kept 
in a place called Dokmas in Tower of Silence and vultures, they feed on it. It's a very eco-friendly way of disposing of carcasses. But now there are no vultures left and so they have to use solar concentrators to desiccate the body, which is not very efficient. And vultures also played a very important role in Indian mythology and you, as you know, Jatayu was the one who tried to save Sita from the clutches of Ravan when he had abducted her. And you know, vultures were so common. As I said, there were about four, four crows or 40 million birds. And when there's a species which is so common, if, if uh, unless you are regularly monitoring it, you will never notice that whether they are declining or increasing. Because a bird which was which was which had a population of over 40 millions, even if they lose half of their population, 20 million is a huge number, and you will not notice it if they are declining or not. Only you can find out that they are declining when you do regular monitoring of these species. So fortunately, Bombay Natural History Society monitors raptor and vulture population across the country in different national parks and sanctuaries. So we were monitoring vulture population in uh, Kerala National Park, which is in Rajasthan. And we were doing it in uh, early in 80s and also in 90s. And in 90s, we realized uh, uh, in 80s, we, we found that there were over 353 nests of vultures in the park. But by mid 90s, we had lost over 50% of the uh, population and just 150 vulture nesting pairs remained. And by 2000, we have lost we have no vultures in the park. And similarly, we also do uh, vultures surveys all over the country. And we realized that the population of vultures had crashed all over. And by 2000, we had lost 97% of the population. And we do this uh, population monitoring every four years. And in 2007, we realized that we have lost 99% of the population of these three species in the country. But since then, we could take conservation measures. And by 2012, we realized that the population of white-backed vulture, which was the most common vulture in the country, had stopped declining. And it was probably increasing slightly after 2012. But the population was very small. And there was no uh, chance of complacency. So we, ha we had to be very alert to still, uh, because this world can still go extinct. <laughs> and uh, similarly, the long-billed vulture, which was also very common, was declining, but its population uh, was not declining as used to be earlier, but and it was uh, but the rate of decline had slowed down. So, you know, now what, this is what happens when the, there's no vultures, the carcasses lie uh, rotting in the open. And what the, you see now, this, uh, what all you see, this white stuff is actually maggots. When what you don't see is the bacteria and fungus which grows in this. And maggots, of course, you know, are the lava of flies, they cause disease. And similarly, the bacteria and fungus we grow into it also cause disease. So, the loss of vultures has really caused, uh, 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 has impacted the human and animal health system in the country. So because, uh, you know, when vultures were in great numbers, as soon as the animal will die and is thrown out in the open, the vultures will come and completely cover up the carcass and the dogs will have no chance in getting at the carcass. But now since... Uh, there are no vultures, the dogs get to eat a lot of food. And as you know, dogs are like vermin. Whenever there's food abundance, they have bigger litter size. And dogs are also cannibal. So usually they litter at isolated places where other dogs cannot reach. But now dogs will find littering in car at carcass dumps in the rib cages of cattle. And the pups which grow up here in these carcass dumps are ferocious. And whenever they come across humans and animals, they attack. And as you know, the dog carries all sorts of all kinds of diseases, especially the rabies, which is fatal to human. So uh, because of the uh, crash in vulture population, uh, uh, it has really impacted human and animal health. Although we are not sure how much, uh, the what, by what percentage, the incidences of rabies has increased because of the crash in vulture population, but there is certainly 
they as uh, an increase in rabies incidence because of loss of vulture populations. So when we, the vulture started dying and the population was going down, we tried to find out what was, what was the reason of the crash in vulture population. So we looked at food, food availability, because if there is shortage of food, the population crash. So we found that there was enough food for vultures. Only 5% of the uh, uh, cattle carcasses which are available to vultures had uh, scam vultures feeding on them. The rest of them had dogs and other scavengers attending to it. Then we looked at habitat. And you know, vultures are found from desert to evergreen forest. And we found that uh, there was no problem for vultures anywhere. So vultures, you know, wherever they are found, they don't have a particular uh, preference for a particular tree. Whatever the tallest tree available, they occupy that. And so even in Rajasthan, they <coughs> occupy trees which are about 30 feet high, but in evergreen forest, they can occupy trees which are over 200 feet high also. So there was no problem with habitat. <coughs> Then we thought that maybe the pesticides or this uh, organochlorines, which could have impacted the population of vultures, because as you know, organochlorines have created havoc with vulture, with bird population across the world. We almost lost peregrine falcon because of introduction of DDT in the in the in the in Europe and America. So we looked at uh, the tissues of the dead vultures, and we did find pesticide load in them, but not enough to cause even breeding failure or mortality. So pesticide was ruled out as a problem. So then uh, when uh, we were trying to find out was we were killing vultures, we were looking around and we would find vultures sitting with their necks drooping down. And once these symptoms appear, the vultures will die within 10 to 15 days. And it looked typical uh, <coughs> disease symptom. Although when the symptoms will appear, if the vultures are disturbed, they will assume normal person, they will fly off, they, they will find food and everything, but then they will gradually become weak and die. So we collected carcasses of these vultures and when we opened them up, we found that all most of these vultures suffered from visceral gout, which is a condition when there is a renal failure <laughs> and vultures cannot excrete out uric acid and uric acid gets deposited on the visceral organs and they die of dehydration because, you know, the the uh, other function of kidneys to reabsorb water, but which we cannot do. And then vultures die of dehydration and die a very painful death. So uh, um, since we thought that the vultures were looking sick and all, we thought maybe they are dying of a disease. So we in started in investigating and we took help of various organizations uh, nationally and internationally. And we did isolate a very virulent herpes virus, but in the meantime, when we were studying vultures in India, there were uh, an NGO from US which was studying vultures in Pakistan, this NGO called Peregrine Fund. They had very sim similar results as we had, like vulture, they also vultures were dying of visceral gout. They additionally, what they found out that the vultures which had died of visceral gout also had residues of a drug called diclofenac. And diclofenac is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug given to cattle in pain and inflammation. So what they did, they fed vultures orally on diclofenac as well as through buffalo meat. And they, uh, they found that the vulture died showing very, very similar symptoms. So it was a very, a very clear indication that the vultures were dying of diclofenac poisoning. So when they found in Pakistan that the vultures were dying of diclofenac poisoning, we also looked at the vulture tissue samples which we had collected at uh, vulture center in uh, in Pinjor in Haryana, and we had collected vultures from all over the country. And seventy-two percent of these vultures had died of visceral gout, and all the vultures which had died of visceral gout, when we looked at their tissue samples, we found that they had residues of diclofenac. Then we also looked at prevalence of diclofenac when the views, uh, the way it has been used across the country, and we found that it was a very popular drug. So it was a quite clear in, uh, indication that the vultures were indeed dying of diclofenac in the country. But you know, when we found out that the vultures were actually dying of 
uh, diclofenac, it was very difficult for us to believe that uh, diclofenac can kill vultures across the country because uh, diclofenac is a very good drug for vultures, uh, for cattle. It, uh, it, uh, uh, cattle and humans. It is one of the few drugs which can break the brain blood barrier and it gives release uh, almost immediately. Within uh, You give uh, administer diclofenac to a cattle and within 15 minutes it gets relief. And, but if the cattle should die within 72 hours of administration of diclofenac and then vultures should feed on it and then only they will die. So it was too much of a coincidence. So what we did, we uh, it was very difficult to understand that vultures in our country were actually dying of diclofenac. So we collected all the information and we took help of one professor V screen of Cambridge University. And we gave him, gave him all information on vulture ecology the, 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 uh, uh, and the toxicity of diclofenac and how far the vultures go to forage and how often the feed and all. And then he came, gave us a figure of that, uh, of if the, if less than point one person, less than one percent of the cattle carcasses which are available to vultures to forage have diclofenac, it can cause the kind of crash in vulture population we have seen. So uh, when we looked at the carcasses uh, across the country and we found that over 10% of the carcasses had diclofenac. So it was a very clear indication that diclofenac was indeed killing vultures. So once we knew that the diclofenac was killing vultures and uh, uh, we had lost uh, uh, by 99% uh, of the vulture population. So we recommended the government of India uh, uh, that this is what is happening. So fortunately for us, government of India acted very swiftly and prepared a vulture action plan in 2006, which gave three major recommendations. The first was to identify a safe alternative to diclofenac, then to ban the veterinary use of diclofenac, and then to start a conservation breeding program. So, you know, when we asked government of India to ban the use of diclofenac for veterinary use, they said that they will not be able to ban it because diclofenac is a very useful drug for cattle. And uh, we have a huge cattle uh, uh, dairy farm industries in the, in the country. And uh, they will be able to ban this drug only if there is a safer alternative. So we looked for safer alternative by... Uh, uh, looking at the drugs which are used to treat uh, vultures and raptors across the world in the zoos. And we found that there was a drug called meloxicam, which were used for, to treat vultures and raptors, and it has never caused any mortality. So we did a safety testing of meloxicam on vultures, and we found that it was safe to vultures and did cause any you know, problem. So, you know, what happens when diclofen in uh, NSA toxicity that the uric acid levels in the blood really shoots up. But when uh, diclofenac is given, the uric acid levels they shoot up. But when meloxicam is given, nothing really happens to the blood parameters and it was considered safe. So even uh, so, government of India quickly uh, banned the veterinary use of diclofenac in 2006 when we gave this recommendation that they should ban diclofenac and uh, instead use meloxicam for that. So they banned it to 2006, but we found that the birds were still dying. And we found that people were using human formulation of diclofenac for treating cattle. And uh, so we, uh, we again went to government of India uh, and requested them that they should restrict the use of uh, uh, human formulation to just 3 ml because that is what the human dose is actually is uh, is required but for the big companies for their own uh, uh, profit they make multi dose vials and the people who treat cattle and in india it's not only veterinarians who treat cattle anybody who owns a cattle and who knows anything about these drugs they treat, uh, they treat cattle so they will buy a big 30 ml while uh, of a human formulation and then it will inject cattle. And it, typically a cattle requires just 10 to 15 ml for treatment. So, so we requested government of India to ban the 
uh, this 30 ml wire for human use and use only 3 ml ampule for treating cattle. So then uh, the third uh, uh, recommendation was to establishment of vulture conservation breeding program. As you know, conservation breeding program are not the best of conservation options, but since we had lost 99% of the vulture population, so we thought of having conservation breeding program in the country and conservation breeding has really saved species from extinctions across the world, like Californian condor breeding program in US, where only 21 birds were left and they caught all of the birds, did a conservation breeding program and now they have over 450 birds and uh, the birds are still surviving. Although the main cause of mortality has still not been removed from the system. So now we have established eight different centers in the country. Uh, the centers at Pinjor, Rajabad, Kawa and Assam and Bhopal are managed by Bombay Nature Society and rest of the centers are managed by the Central Zoo Authority. Uh, so uh, when we thought of having a conservation breeding program, the main object, uh, the main concern was how many we should breed because it's not difficult to breed vultures if you give them the right condition. So we thought of uh, 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 breeding 600 pairs, uh, we thought of releasing 600 pairs of each of the three species in the wild, which will form a genetically viable and self-sustaining population. And to get the 600 pairs in, uh, to be released in the wild, we thought of establishing six different centers in the country. And from each center, we would be releasing 100 pairs in the wild. And to get 100 pairs from each center, we thought of having 25 pairs founder pairs of each of the three species in six different centers. And so this is a typical conservation building center, which was established first in the country. And that is in Pinjar. It's called the Jatayu Conservation Building Center. So uh, the center has various aviaries for various purposes. You know, when you keep birds in captivity in large number, you have to be very careful about the disease because if the disease spreads, you it will be very difficult to save uh, the birds in captivity. So we have a good quarantine facility, which is about 45 kilometers, which is about 10 kilometers from the center. And we keep birds there in 45 days. And then we bring to the main center. And you know, vultures are slow breeding and long breeding birds. So uh, they and they leave, uh, they uh, lay only one egg per year, and only uh, uh, and they start breeding only then they are five to six years old, and they can live almost to thirty five to forty years old. But you can age a bird only till it is about five years old. So to get uh, in a conservation breeding program, you should have known age birds. So to have known age birds, we thought we collected nestlings of first year birds for the conservation breeding program. So be, because you can age a bird only till it's five years old. So if we collected a, a nestling or juvenile, we uh, put it in a nursery every. Otherwise, if it was first year bird, it was kept in uh, holding aviaries. So this is our biggest aviary. It's called colony aviary. It is 100 feet long, 40 feet wide and 20 feet high. And since vultures are social birds, we keep about 30 to 35 birds in these aviaries. So the birds are kept in these aviaries after they are three to four years old and they uh, themselves make pairs in the aviary. And since they are social birds, they, uh, they don't maintain big territories. They only occupy a nesting ledge and that's what they uh, defend. And uh, the aviaries have a soft netting on the top. So, which is of netlon. So even if the vultures collide with it, they don't get injured. So the flooring is of soft of mud and sand. It has got good ventilation, big windows. So we have a, a food hatch from where we uh, put the food in. And, and we also have a nesting, uh, uh, a, a ledge from where we uh, give the nesting material. So, uh, and vultures, they themselves pick up the nesting material and make their own nests. So we have different aviaries for different purposes. We have a display aviary 
where uh, you know our centers are off display and it's not for public so but people do come to the center and they want to see live birds so we have display everies right in the beginning of the center where we can see, show live birds to people but they are the birds which are not used for breeding program then we have hospital every especially for the birds which get sick in the center and they are treated there and we also have small breeding everies where we thought of keeping individual pairs for breeding but since vultures are social birds they prefer breeding in colony areas so all our birds are ma marked they because in a breeding program you need to have uh, need to know uh, uh, each and every bird so we put a wing tag we also put a le leg band and we put a microchip in uh, in the breast muscles of all the birds and we keep their uh, we take their morphometrics and store all the data electronically because it is important to know uh, about every bird because to maintain the genetics for a breeding program so we do have a, a good laboratory facility in all our centers we uh, we do hematology we also do uh, biochemistry especially we monitor uh, the uric acid levels in the blood and since vultures are not sexually dimorphic we use their uh, uh, their dna for sexing and we also have a microbiology lab to see their gut flora and fauna so uh, we feed vultures on goat meat and we keep goats with us for 10 days and this is done because if they are the goats are treated with diclofenac the diclofenac is excreted out within 72 hours so we just uh, we get the entire carcasses to the vultures and each vulture gets uh, two kilos of uh, four kilos of meat per week and vultures are fed twice a week because they are vultures are scavengers they don't, they don't have to feed every day so they are fed twice a week and four kilos of meat per vulture that works out to be five percent of the body weight per week and there is no hierarchy in the world in uh, uh, in vultures the hungry bird is more dominant not the powerful one and uh, and they are very efficient fast feeders they have a long muscular tongue and they can actually slurp meat. So they finish off food within 20 minutes or so. And of the vultures are quite clean birds. They take bath almost every day and especially after meal. And here also there is no hierarchy. It is almost one by one they come and take bath and uh, hardly any fights because they are social birds and it is advantageous for these birds to remain together. But these birds take bath only when the water, fresh water is given to them. So when, when uh, in earlier days, we were not topping up the water troughs every day. So the birds will not take bath. And we, since we started topping off water, the birds would start taking bath almost every day. And you will notice how thoroughly they take bath and it's almost one by one. And once there is good sunshine, the, all, the, all the activities of vultures are synchronized because they are social birds. Whether they are feeding, they are bathing or sunning, they do it together. Or even egg laying is done almost at the same time. So when there is bright sunshine, these birds spread their wings. And this is more to shed ectoparasites and for thermoregulation. And uh, birds are although kept in captivity, but uh, they love to take to do wing exercise and if these birds can do these rigorous wing exercise they can keep their muscles in very good shape and once they are released back in the wild they are able to fly immediately so uh, you'll see how rigorous wing exercise they do and this is how they keep themselves in good shape so all of the birds will be doing the same because the uh, they all their activities are synchronized so you see how uh rigorous wing exercises they do and so a lot of people think that if you keep birds in captivity they won't be able to fly when you release them wild it is not true and these birds they are long living birds so they start pairing up only when they are three to four years old and the male offers a tweak to the female and if the female accepts it they become a pair for life 
So after three years, they start also, they identify a nest, they start nest building. They all, may also lay egg, but which is not fertile. They lay fertile eggs only after six to seven years old and they pay for life. But if one of them dies, they, they, it, is, it is replaced almost immediately. So the nesting happens at the center, it happens in the wild. They start nesting by September and by they take about two months to make nest and by December they egg lay, uh, lay, lay egg. It, there's 55 days of incubation and the nestling stays on the nest for three, four months. And we all have CCTVs in the uh, all the aviaries. So the birds lay one egg when usually at dusk and dawn. And both the sexes that they uh, take equal part in incubation. So they have long incubation shift. They always share all the duties equally. So once they are sitting on incubation, some, they also roll the eggs uh, almost nine times a day just to make sure that the egg gets uh, warmth on all the sides so the embryo doesn't stick onto the egg. So since they have long incubation shifts, <coughs> they, it can be a bird can be sitting on a nest for eight to 10 hours. So they get stiffened up. So they do vigorous wing exercises like the one this bird is doing. But this, they lay egg in the winters when it is very cold. So they don't leave the eggs unattended. And when the chick hatches, the birds, they brood the chick because it, it hatches with a very sparse uh, coat of down and its summer regulation is not well developed, but it is fed from the day one on the meat which bird collects from the and keeps it in his crop and regurgitate to the chick. So birds, they also the, help the chick in hatching. Uh, the, when the chick is born, it is only about uh, 150 grams and within five months, it becomes five, within three to four months, become five kilos. So its calcium requirement is very high. So the birds, uh, they feed, they bring big bones uh, from the carcasses and they feed to the chick. You'll see how big bone the, the big, uh, they regurgitate and the chick picks it up. And since they have a very acidic digestion, they, the bone gets digested very fast. And uh, both the birds are very attentive. They are, uh, when they bring the food to the nestling, the other birds uh, try to uh, uh, control the morsel which comes out of the, uh, uh, which the bird regurgitates and uh, just to make sure the chick doesn't uh, choke up. And you see how big a bone it regurgitates with the chick swallow, swallows up and uh, which is very good for its calcium requirement. See how the big bone it swallows. So when the chick is about two months old, it starts standing up. And that is, we are really worried till it is it starts standing up because if in, within two months it doesn't stand up, that means it has calcium deficiency and then it won't be able to stand and it will develop metabolic bone disease and it will probably die. So we have to be very careful in giving the right amount of calcium to them. So now we have developed a manual for vulture conservation program program, which is uh, by, done by the CZA and it gives guidelines on how to run a center and how to bring up the nestlings and release them in the wild also. So we have now a good number of birds in captivity. We have about more than 750 birds in captivity in all the centers. But you will notice that most of the birds are in the center managed by Bombay Natural Society, that is in Pinjor, Baksa, Rani, and Bhopal. In Pinjor center, we have most number of birds because we practice artificial incubation and double clutching. We have over three, 370 birds in Pinjor. And we have been successful in uh, breeding all the three species in captivity. And we have bred over 440 uh, birds in captivity so far in this in different centers. So we do artificial incubation to, uh, you know, what happens that the vultures lay only one egg per year, but if they, for some reason, they lose their eggs within uh, three weeks or so, they tend to lay again. And we take advantage of that. 
So the one vulture lay an egg. We remove the egg within 10 days and we uh, incubate it artificially and the vultures lay again within three weeks and then they incubate it. Uh, the parents incubate in the nest. So in, in this way, we try to make sure that we get one chick from each pair because, you know, the hatching or uh, the nesting circus is just 50% in these large and big birds. So this is how we remove the egg. And, you know, although they are big birds, they don't really attack. And when you go to take the egg, they fly away. And we take the eggs very carefully. We mark the eggs on the nest and then bring them down to the incubation room in a, in a padded box. So we don't jerk it. We, but we make sure that we write down everything about the, uh, the nest on which parent it belongs to. Then we bring it to the incubation room, which is thermocontrolled. And we uh, hatch, incubate the eggs at 35.6 to 30.9 degrees uh, temperature. And this is the best for the hatching of these eggs. And once they uh, come to the uh, incubation room, we uh, candle it just to see. And this is how we monitor the growth of the embryo in the egg. And the vulture's egg should lose 15 to 17% of its weight by the time it hatches and for successful hatching. So we uh, weigh the birds, we weigh the eggs every third day, and we also uh, candle it every six days. And if the bird is the egg is not losing enough weight, what we do is we drill it. And if it is using a lot of weight, we then we put water and include humidity. When the egg is 40 days old, we keep it on a half surface, and that is when, when it starts twitching. And that is when we are sure that there is life and there is chicken inside. And in, by 50 days, it starts calling from inside, and by 53rd day, it, it breaks, and by 55 days, it hatches. So it hatches with a very sparse course of down, and but we start feeding it from the, the second day itself. And from third day itself, we start giving him all, all body parts, but we keep a very good eye on its in weight. We, uh, we try to make sure that it weight is the very regulated increase in this weight. For first three days, it will, it should increase only 3% of the 5% uh, of the body weight per day and by till 20th day only by 9% and by 30th day by 7% and by 40th day by 5% and after that only just 2% of the 2% uh, every day so we give, feed it on uh, uh, goat meat and this is how we do it and once the chick is about uh, 10 days old, we return the chick to the nest and we collect its second egg. So this is called chick, chick swapping and we incubate the second egg, uh, clutch of egg in incubator and this has really increased the hatchability. We, uh, we have been able to increase the hatching success of the eggs very much by this. And uh, we keep raise the chicks in groups just to prevent uh, uh, imprinting and we also uh, mark these birds once they are uh, 30 to 40 days old just to make sure that uh, we know uh, the uh, identity of each chick and once they are about uh, able to fly we keep them together in uh, holding aviaries all data is stored electronically and we have just to make sure their genetics is all right. And so we have been successful in uh, breeding all the three species of vultures in captivity. And now the use of diclofenac has also gone down. Now uh, we do carcass sampling across the country and we know now that the diclofenac prevalence is less than 2% in the carcasses. So now we have decided to do and the government of India has also banned, restricted the uh, vial size of human formulation to just 3 ml. So now we have thought of doing reintroduction of birds in the wild. So we have decided to do soft release of the birds in the wild 
you know, so our centers are all off display so we don't let public to come in but now since we have to release birds in the wild we need public support so we have invited uh, the chief minister of haryana to come and release birds in pre release every so we will be doing soft release that means we will first release birds in an aviary in the area where we have to release birds but this aviary will be very open and the birds can see all around uh, the habitat in which they are going to be there they will also be exposed to the predators to the crows and what the condition they expect in the wild and we will be uh, we also attract wild birds by putting food just outside the pre release aviary so there is interaction between the wild birds and our captive bird brush because these vultures are social bird we expect that our birds will form flocks with the wild birds and once they are released they will join the wild flock and that thereby their survival will be much better so this is how we have been doing so uh, you know first uh, a lot of people thought that the birds which are kept in captivity if you release them in wild they won't be able to fly or they won't be able to fly find food so what we did we experimentally released two himalayan griffins which are not endangered in the wild and they were with us for last 10 years and we released them in the wild and we invited the uh, union home, uh, forest minister to come and release them remote so he remotely he came and remotely lifted the netting from a height to let the birds go but for first first, first 48 hours for for 24 hours the birds although the netting was open they didn't go out but then they fly flew out the, of the aviary and without any problems we have thought that the birds will have food drink water and then gradually they will go out but nothing like that happened they flew out immediately and fortunately they flew out without uh, colliding anywhere and they uh, were flying very well so this is how it came out of the avery and flew out without colliding anywhere and we kept food the provisioning food to the vultures and the vultures will come and they will feed with the free ranging wild birds and within a within a month or so the birds started flying around they would fly they would start soaring they would also locate food and water and uh, they uh, they would avoid all man made structures trees and all and they were flying like wild birds so it was very satisfying for us to know that the birds which were in captivity for 10 years could fly around like this like a wild bird so now since our first experimental release was successful and the birds had started flying soaring and they could find their own food so now we had started releasing our critically endangered bird into the wild so first releases happened in 2020 from pinjor and also from rajabath thawa in west bengal so we released six birds from pinjor six were captive bred birds and two were wild caught adults so we thought that the wild caught adults would also act as guide birds to our captive bred birds so we had put satellite transmitters on these birds uh, two four birds had satellite transmitters of geotrack made and four birds had transmitters which worked on mobile phone technology they were called the gsm transmitters so this is how it were put on the as a backpack and then these birds were released in the wild by remotely opening the gates by the forest minister of haryana so and we kept provisioning food so with uh, 48 hours they didn't fly away and then gradually they started flying away but they didn't join the flight wild flock but they went one by one in different directions and but and we could track them because they were satellite tagged and now and before releasing the birds we had also monitored the habitat in 100 square 100 kilometers radius just to see that there is a vulture population the food was available in plenty habitat was available and there was no prevalence of diclofenac in that area and there was no other threat so we uh, to monitor the prevalence of diclofenac we ca we carried out undercover pharmacy surveys 
so our guy uh, our local guy will go to each and every, to uh, to pharmacies ask for a drug to treat his injured cattle and whatever the nsaid was uh, offered we will buy and this is how we found out what are the nsaids used in the market and we noticed that the meloxicam was becoming popular diclofenac use was going down but we found out that there are other drugs which are toxic to vultures who are still in the market so we have to work hard to make sure that these drugs uh, use is also restricted and we also monitored food availability for vultures in 100 kilometers areas and we found that there was enough food for the vultures and uh, most of the carcasses didn't have any other scavengers and very few carcasses had vultures attending to it so now we invite various authorities especially the drug controller animal husbandry commissioner to our center just to uh, see what efforts have been taken to save vultures from extinction and this usually have a very good impact so the drug controller uh, uh, came to our center he invited all the chemists and drugist association and told them uh, how not to use drugs which are toxic to vultures and not to sell drugs which are toxic to vultures to the farmers and this has a huge impact so we uh, invite other stakeholders also to the center especially forest department staff the local government and the senior government officers and show them what conservation efforts are being made and how the vultures can be saved by not using the toxic drugs to treat cattle and the government of india has now come up with a vulture action plan uh 2020 25 uh, to 25 and this section plan also gives timeline and also strongly suggest that the use of toxic drugs should be minimized and the drugs which are found toxic should be banned to save vultures from extinction this uh, action plan also recommended recommend setting up vulture centers in different part of the country like they have recommended setting up a center in bangalore and also for other species of vultures so thank you very much this is what all i have like to say and we are not alone we have a lot of supporters in our vulture program and thank you very much i would be happy if you have any questions for me thank you so much thank you thank you ma'am well hello hello Hello. Hello. Sir, can you hear us? Sure. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Uh, why? Why? Uh, why is it that birds can only be aged to five years in captivity? Why not longer? Yeah, uh, after five years, their plumage uh, becomes they reach adulthood, and then then the plumage doesn't change; they re remain the same. So you know you can age these birds based uh, as the plumage changes. But after five years, uh, five year or thirty-five year old birds look the same. So that's why we cannot age them. Any more questions? Uh One more question. During this culture, could you able to make any cross breeding there in the different uh, stages? Cross breeding. But uh, 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 between the species. Yeah, yeah. They are the same species or different species, or they are the subspecies. So 
any uh, classes have been conducted? No, in fact, you know, uh, as we know, they they are not even sister species, so they cannot interbreed. But they definitely can form pairs if you keep them together in one aviary. So we try to try not to keep two species in the same aviary. But there have been instances where they have formed pairs, but uh, but they uh, they laid eggs, but they were infertile. So but, but we. Uh, uh, Avoid keeping uh, two species together in the aviaries. So there are no more questions. I'd like to thank Dr. Mathur for that wonderful and informative talk on vulture conservation. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So uh, we'll take a quick tea break and we'll be back here in 10 minutes because we have two more uh, presenters who will be talking to us. So 10 minutes will be back here. Thank you. Good, good. Computer area sometimes. Hello. Okay. Now Sir, Kedu Star. Mata di sir, enak.
ಸರ್ ಏನು ಕೇಳಿಸ್ತಲ್ಲ ಮಾತಾಡಿ ಏನಾರು ಮಾತಾಡಿ ಸರ್ ಇನ್ನೂ ಏನು ಕೇಳಿಸ್ತಲ್ಲ ಸರ್ ಮಾತಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀರಾ ಸ್ಪಷ್ಟವಾಗಿದ್ಯಾ
and uh, to introduce our next speaker, uh, Mr. Vijay Kondalu, I'd like to invite Dr. Pratibha on stage. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, we'll just uh, change the order of things a bit. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Mr. Devraju. I'd like to invite uh, Manjuna to come here and uh, give a brief introduction before uh, Sir can start his talk. Good morning, all. It's an honor to introduce Mr. V. Devraj, Deputy Commissioner, sorry, Conservative of Forests, Ramnagra. He has completed his Master's in Physics from Bangalore University, worked as a lecturer in Bangalore Institute of Technology in his early part of his career, joined as Range Forest Officer in Forest Department and worked in wildlife areas for almost 12 years. He's a recipient of Anil Kumble Award in 2010 for nabbing elephant and tiger poachers. He is also a recipient of Food Wildlife Award in 2013 for contribution in wildlife management. Presently, he is working as a Deputy Conservator of Forests in Ramanagara. I would like to call upon uh, Mr. V. Devraju for, to give a talk on animal human conflicts. Thank you. Hello, Namaskar. I hope Sumarth and Kannada are both there. I will add in between, I uh, will also talk a little bit of uh, English because mother tongue is always nearer to the other. This is artificial breeding. So, this is a photo where it is naturally bred. Uh, it, it has taken this photo has taken about uh, 20 days back. It is still in uh, Ramdev Beta. Ramdev Beta the Lulu Pura Ida. It is ready to fly. Maybe in another 15 days, it is ready to fly. So this has occurred the Vishya mainly Kalada Namayan Umba Tosha and Wildlife Century Ani for the first time the breeding has taken place. So it is very privileged for us to say. Uh, the breeding is uh, the natural breeding has taken place in uh, Ramdar Beta was just Next. Uh, because uh, there is a Augustus audience here, I would like to introduce the problem faced by the, our department. You know, the human animal conflict and the anyway, Manava of the Rani Sangarsha and the it has reached a peak in, in these days. The Gayana Gita, the now, uh, the Ganano Sumari, so the Yarade is with the Lee, no, no, by the range officer again, but I'll put the Munja by the similar case. So, first of all, I will enter the situation after I told the one the Anne, the other one the Ganda and the Gambut were going to transport to the Ren, and they were by act. The Kendra poaching was very rampant at that time. Anne and a Vargade and a staff get the day first to a Ganda and a Wunda, Kore to Kanta to Anne and a Vargade, a board split card on the other one, the other one identified as the other one. So at that time, the poaching was at its peak. Now, beginning of Lodha, one day there was the day, Sumar Noor Ani Ratna Orpan Ratna, Danta Ratna Dostan Ratna. So that was the horrible situation was there. And the wheel up on time and attack too, and you know, he has shifted his, you know, the offense in the wildlife offense in the kidnapping that has started on to the squad. So wheel up on Palaya Santa Allah, wheel up on Nara, Next generation, Andrea, they are especially from Kerala. 
ಅಲ್ಲೆಲ್ಲ ಸುಮಾರು ಕೋಚಿಂಗ್ ಕೂಡ ಆಗ್ತಾ ಇತ್ತು ಸೊ ಅಂತ ಟೈಮ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಅಂತ ಟೈಮ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ವಾಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ದಿ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಎಷ್ಟು ಅಲಾರಾಮ್ ಇತ್ತು ಅಂತಂದ್ರೆ ನಮ್ಗೆ ಬರೀ ಬೆಂಡಾನೆಗಳು ಕಾಣಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ವಿ ಹೊತ್ತು ಬೆಂಡಾನೆಗಳು ಬಹಳ ಅಪರೂಪ ಇರ್ತಿತ್ತು ಸಿಗುವಂತ ಅದ್ರ ಜೊತೆನಲ್ಲಿ ದಿ ಪಾಪ್ಯುಲೇಷನ್ ಏನು ಒಂದು ರೇಷಿಯೋ ಏನಿದೆ ಮೇಲ್ ಫಿಮೇಲ್ ರೇಷಿಯೋ ಏನಿದೆ ಇಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ಒನ್ ಇಸ್ ಟು ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಇತ್ತು ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಟು ತ್ರೀ ನಲ್ಲಿ ಒನ್ ಇಸ್ ಟು ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಸೆವೆನ್ ವಾಸ್ ದಿ ಮೇಲ್ ಫಿಮೇಲ್ ರೇಷಿಯೋ ಸಂತೋಷ ಏನಂದ್ರೆ ಇವತ್ತು ಒನ್ ಇಸ್ ಟು ಟು ಅಥವಾ ಒನ್ ಇಸ್ ಟು ತ್ರೀ ಬಂದಿದೆ ದಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ದಿ ರೇಷಿಯೋ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಮೇಲ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಫಿಮೇಲ್ ಸೊ ಅಂತ ಸಿಚುವೇಶನ್ ಇತ್ತು ಅಂತ ಸಿಚುವೇಶನ್ ಇದ್ದಂತ ಟೈಮ್ ಇಂದ ನೌ ವಿ ಹವ್ ರೀಚ್ ದ ಸ್ಟೇಜ್ ವೇರ್ ನಮ್ಮ ಪಾಪ್ಯುಲೇಷನ್ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಪಾಪ್ಯುಲೇಷನ್ ಇದೆ ನೌ ಇಟ್ ಹಸ್ ರೀಚ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ದಿ ಇಡೀ ಇಂಡಿಯಾದಲ್ಲಿ ನಂಬರ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಪಾಪ್ಯುಲೇಷನ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ನಾವು ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಲುಕ್ ಅಟ್ ದಿ ಟೈಗರ್ ಅಗೇನ್ ನಾವು ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಇದೀವಿ ಮಧ್ಯಪ್ರದೇಶ ಜೊತೆ ಅದು ಏನಂದ್ರೆ ಬಹಳ ಡಿಫ್ರೆನ್ಸ್ ಇಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಫ್ಯೂ ನಂಬರ್ ಒಂದು ವಿತ್ ಇನ್ ಟೆನ್ ಏನೋ ಇದೆ ನಂಬರ್ಸ್ ಅಷ್ಟೇ ಸೊ ಅಗೇನ್ ಅಲ್ಲೂ ಕೂಡ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಇದೀವಿ ವಿ ಗೋ ಟು ಓವರ್ ಟೇಕ್ ಮಧ್ಯಪ್ರದೇಶ ದಿಸ್ ಇಯರ್ ಡ್ಯೂರಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸೆನ್ಸಸ್ ಈ ತರ ಸಿಚುವೇಶನ್ ಕ್ರಿಯೇಟ್ ಆಗಿದೆ ನೋ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಮೂವ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಜಂಗಲ್ ಏನಾಗಿದೆ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಲುಕ್ ಅಟ್ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಹರ್ಡ್ ಇರ್ತು ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಫೈಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ ದಿ ಏನು ಏಜ್ ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಚರ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಬಿಗ್ಗರ್ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಇಂದ ಏನು ಅಡಲ್ಟ್ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಇಂದ ಸಬ್ ಅಡಲ್ಟ್ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಮರಿಗಳು ಎಲ್ಲದೂ ಕೂಡ ಒಂದು ಪೂರ್ಣ ಕುಟುಂಬವನ್ನ ನಾವೀಗ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ನೋಡಬಹುದು ಸೊ ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಪಾಪ್ಯುಲೇಷನ್ ಇಂಕ್ರೀಸ್ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಈಗ ಇಷ್ಟಾಯ್ತು ಅಂತಂದ್ರೆ ನಾವು ಫಾರೆಸ್ಟ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಬಹಳ ಖುಷಿ ಕೊಡ್ಬೋದು ಯಾಕೆ ವೈಲ್ಡ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಪಾಪ್ಯುಲೇಷನ್ ಇಸ್ ಇನ್ಕ್ರೀಸ್ ಸೊ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಗುಡ್ ಎಲ್ಲಾ ಕಡೆಯಿಂದ ಅಕ್ಲಮೇಷನ್ ಬರ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಬಟ್ ನಾವ್ ಎಂತ ಪರಿಸ್ಥಿತಿ ಬಂದಿದ್ದೇವೆ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ವಿ ಕೆನಾಟ್ ಸೆಲೆಬ್ರೇಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಏನು ನಮ್ಮ ಅಕ್ಲಮೇಷನ್ ಏನ್ ಬರ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಹೊರಗಡೆ ಏನ್ ಬರ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಏನಿದೆ ನಾವು ಅದನ್ನ ಸೆಲೆಬ್ರೇಟ್ ಮಾಡೋಕೆ ಆಗದೆ ಇರೋ ಸಿಚುವೇಶನ್ ಬಂದಿದೆ ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಕಾರಣಗಳು ಹಲವಾರು ಹೆಚ್ಚಾಗಿ ನಮ್ಗೆ ಏನಾಗ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಈ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಮತ್ತೆ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಕಾನ್ಫ್ಲಿಕ್ಟ್ ಅನ್ನೋದು ತುಂಬಾ ಜಾಸ್ತಿ ಸೊ ಬೇಸಿಕಲಿ ಈ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಏನಂತ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಮೋರ್ ನಿಯರ್ ಟು ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ಸ್ ಒಂದು ಯಾವ ತರ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಮುಂಚೆ ಬಹಳ ಹಿಂದಿನ ಕಾಲದಿಂದ ಕೂಡ ಈ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಏನಾಗಿದೆ ನಮ್ ಜೊತೆ ಮಹಾರಾಜರು ಯುದ್ಧದಲ್ಲಿ ಯೂಸ್ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ರು ಆನೆ ಸಾಕ್ತಾ ಇದ್ರು ಸೊ ಸಮ್ ಇಟ್ ಹಸ್ ಬಿಕಮ್ ವೆರಿ ನಿಯರ್ ಟು ದಿ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ಸ್ ಅದಕ್ಕೂ ಕೂಡ ತನ್ನದೇ ಆದ ಕಾರಣ ಇದೆ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ಇವನ್ ದೋ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಹ್ಯೂಜ್ ಅನಿಮಲ್ ನಮ್ಗೂ ಮತ್ತೆ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಗು ಸಾಕಷ್ಟು ಸಾಮ್ಯತೆಗಳಿವೆ ಒಂದು ಇಫ್ ಯು ಟೇಕ್ ಅಟ್ ದಿ ಏಜ್ ನಮ್ಮ ಏನು ಆಯಸ್ ಅಂತ ಏನ್ ಹೇಳ್ತೀವಿ ನಾವು ಆ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಆಯಸ್ ಏನಿದೆ ಆಲ್ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಸಿಮಿಲರ್ ಟು ದಿ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ಸ್ ವೈಲ್ಡ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಇದ್ರೆ ಒಂದು ಅರವತ್ತೈದು ವರ್ಷ ಅರವತ್ತೈದು ವರ್ಷ ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿ ಆರೋಗ್ಯವಾಗಿ ಬದುಕಿರುತ್ತೆ ಇದ್ರಲ್ಲಿ ಇದ್ರೆ ಏನೋ ಒಂದು ಕ್ಯಾಂಪ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಇದ್ರೆ ಇನ್ನೊಂದ್ ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಒಂದಷ್ಟು ನಾವು ಅಷ್ಟೇ ತಾನೆ ಒಂದ್ ಅದೇ ಸೇಮ್ ರೇಂಜ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಇದನ್ನ ಮಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ಅದೇ ರೀತಿ ಕೂಡ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ವೆರಿ ಸೋಷಿಯಲ್ ಅನಿಮಲ್ಸ್ ಟೈಪಸ್ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಸಮಾಜದ ಜೊತೆ ಅವುಗಳದೇ ಆದ ಒಂದು ಸಮಾಜ ಅವುಗಳದೇ ಆದ ಒಂದು ಕುಟುಂಬ ಅದೇ ರೀತಿ ಅಲ್ಲೂ ಕೂಡ ಇದೆ ಈ ನಿಮ್ಗೆಲ್ಲ ಕೃಪಾಕರ್ ಸೇನ ಗೊತ್ತಿಲ್ಲ ಒಂದ್ಸರಿ ಒಂದು ಇನ್ಸಿಡೆನ್ಸ್ ಹೇಳ್ತಾ ಇದ್ರು ಅವರು ದೇವರ್ ಟೇಕಿಂ
ಒಂದಕ್ಕೊಂದು ಅವು ಸೋಷಿಯಲ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿಯನ್ಸ್ ನಮ್ಮ ಇದ್ದಿದೆ ಅವನು ನೀವೆಲ್ಲ ನೋಡಿದ್ರೆ ಕಬಿನಿ ಬಹುಶಃ ಸುಮಾರು ಜನ ಕೇಳಿದೆ ಈ ಕಬಿನಿ ಏನಂತಂದ್ರೆ ಬಹಳ ವಿಶಿಷ್ಟವಾದ ಜಾಗ ನಾಗರಹೊಳೆ ಮತ್ತೆ ಬಂಡೀಪುರ ಎರಡು ಸೇರುವಂತ ಜಾಗ ಎರಡು ಈ ಕಡೆ ಬಂದ ಎಡಗಡೆ ಬಂದ್ರೆ ಬಂಡೀಪುರ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ಬಲಗಡೆ ಬಂದ್ರೆ ನಾಗರಹೊಳೆ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ಈ ಕಡೆ ಸೊ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಏನಾಗುತ್ತೆ ಡ್ಯಾಮ್ ಕಟ್ಟಿದ್ದಾದ್ಮೇಲೆ ನೀರ್ ಸ್ಟೋರೇಜ್ ಆಗಿರುತ್ತಲ್ಲ ಮುಂಚೆ ಎರಡು ಡ್ಯಾಮ್ ಕಟ್ಟೋದಕ್ಕಿಂತ ಮುಂಚೆ ಒಂದು ಒಳ್ಳೆ ನದಿ ಇತ್ತು ಕಬ್ಬಿನ ನದಿ ನೀರು ಹೋಗ್ತಾ ಇತ್ತು ಡ್ಯಾಮ್ ಕಟ್ಟಿದ್ದಾದ್ಮೇಲೆ ಈ ಮಳೆಗಾಲದಲ್ಲಿ ನೀರು ತುಂಬಿರುತ್ತೆ ಬೇಸಿಗೆ ಕಾಲದಲ್ಲಿ ನೀರು ಕಡಿಮೆ ಆಗ್ತಾ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ಸೊ ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಗ್ರಾಸು ಮತ್ತೆ ಎಲ್ಲ ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿ ಬಂದಿರುತ್ತೆ ಆ ಟೈಮ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಏನಾಗುತ್ತೆ ಈ ಆನೆಗಳು ನಮ್ಮ ಏನು ಕ್ಲಸ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ಇದೆಲ್ಲ ಮುದುಮಲ ಆಗಿರ್ಬೋದು ಅಥವಾ ನಮ್ಮ ಯಾವ್ದೇ ಬೇರೆ ಬೇರೆ ಕಾಡದ ನಾಗರಳೆ ಬಂಡೀಪುರ ಮತ್ತೆ ಎಲ್ಲಾ ನಮ್ಮ ತಮಿಳ್ನಾಡು ಮತ್ತೆ ಎಲ್ಲಾ ಕಾಡುಗಳಿಂದ ಸೇರಿ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಕಾಂಗ್ರೆಗೇಷನ್ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಈ ಏಪ್ರಿಲ್ ಮೇ ತಿಂಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ನೀರು ಕಡಿಮೆ ಆಗುತ್ತ ಕಾಲದಲ್ಲಿ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸಿ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸಿ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಕೌಂಟ್ ದಿ ನಂಬರ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ನೂರ ಐವತ್ತು ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಇನ್ನೂರ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಮುನ್ನೂರ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಕೌಂಟ್ ಕೌಂಟ್ ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಸೊ ಆ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಕಾಂಗ್ರೆಗೇಷನ್ ಆದಾಗ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ನೋಟಿಸ್ ನೀವು ಯಾವ್ದಾರು ಫೋಟೋಗ್ರಾಫ್ಸ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಇದರಲ್ಲಿ ನೋಡಬೇಕು ಮನುಷ್ಯರು ತರಣೇನೆ ಆನೆಗಳಿಗೂ ಹೆಣ್ಮಕ್ಳೇ ಸ್ಟ್ರಾಂಗ್ ಫ್ಯಾಮಿಲಿ ಅದೇ ತರನೇ ಇದು ಅದು ಯಾವಾಗ್ಲೂ ಈ ಮದರ್ ಅಂತ ಇದೆಯಲ್ಲ ಮದರ್ ದೊಡ್ಡಮ್ಮ ಆ ದೊಡ್ಡಮ್ಮ ಇವ್ರಿಗೆ ಎಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಫ್ಯಾಮಿಲಿ ಎಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಅರ್ಡ್ ಅವ್ರ ಜೊತೆ ಕೂತ್ಕೊಂಡು ಈ ಸುತ್ತಮುತ್ತ ಪ್ರಾಣಿಗಳು ಇರ್ತಾರೆ ಈಗ ನೀವು ಅಬ್ಸರ್ವ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ರಲ್ಲ ನಮ್ಮ ಮದುವೆಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಅಬ್ಸರ್ವ್ ಮಾಡಿದಾಗ ಮದುವೆ ರಿಸೆಪ್ಷನ್ ಇರುತ್ತೆ ರಿಸೆಪ್ಷನ್ ಮುಗಿತ ಬಂದಿರುತ್ತೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಎಲ್ಲಾರು ಏನಾಗ್ತಾರೆ ಒಂದು ಕಾಂಗ್ರಿಗೇಟ್ ಆಗ್ತಾರೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಹೆಣ್ಮಕ್ಳು ಮತ್ತೆ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಏನಾಗುತ್ತೆ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಯಾ ಯಾವ ತರ ಕೂತ್ಕೋತಾರೆ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಅವ್ರ ತವ್ರ ಮನೆ ಕಡೆ ಅವ್ರು ಮಾತ್ರ ಕೂತ್ಕೋತಾರೆ ಒಂದು ಗುಂಪಲ್ಲಿ ಅವ್ರ ಮಗ ಎಲ್ಲ ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ದೂರದಲ್ಲಿ ಕೂತಿರ್ತಾರೆ ಸೊ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸಿ ದಟ್ ಕಾಂಗ್ರಿಗೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಆ ಮೆಟರ್ನಲ್ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಇರ್ತಾವಲ್ಲ ಆ ಕಾಂಗ್ರಿಗೇಷನ್ ನೀವು ಇದನ್ನ ನೋಡ್ಬೋದು ಸೊ ನಾನು ಇದನ್ನ ಯಾಕೆ ಹೇಳ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಟೆಲಿಜೆಂಟ್ ಅನಿಮಲ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ವೆರಿ ಸೋಷಿಯಲ್ ಅನಿಮಲ್ಸ್ ಸೊ ಬೇಸಿಕಲಿ ನಾನು ಈಗ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಅನಿಮಲ್ ಕಾನ್ಫ್ಲಿಕ್ಟ್ ಬಂದಿದ್ದೀನಿ ಇದನ್ನೆಲ್ಲ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ಗ್ರೌಂಡ್ ಕೊಟ್ಟಿದ್ದು ಜನಕ್ಕೆ ಅಂತಂದ್ರೆ ಸೊ ಈ ಯೂಶಲ್ ಆಗಿ ನಾರ್ಮಲ್ ಆಗಿ ಏನಂತ ಹೇಳ್ತಾರೆ ಈ ಆನೆಗಳು ಕಾಡಿಂದ ಹೊರಗಡೆ ಬಂದಾಗ ಹೊರಗಡೆ ಬರ್ಬೇಕಾದ್ರೆ ಕಾರಣ ಏನು ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಸರಿಯಾಗಿ ಆಹಾರ ಸಿಗಲ್ಲ ಫಾರೆಸ್ಟ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಏನು ಗಿಡ ಮರ ಏನು ಬೆಳೆಸಿಲ್ಲ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ನೀರ್ ಸಿಗಲ್ಲ ಸೊ ದೀಸ್ ಆರ್ ದಿ ಕಾಮನ್ ಕಂಪ್ಲೇಂಟ್ಸ್ ನಾವು ಯಾವ್ದೇ ಒಂದು ಮೀಟಿಂಗ್ ಹೋಗ್ಲಿ ಅಥವಾ ಎಲ್ಲೇ ಹೋಗ್ಲಿ ಕೂಡ ನಿಮ್ಗೆ ಕಾರಣ ಸರಿಯಾಗಿ ಮೇಂಟೈನ್ ಮಾಡಿಲ್ಲ ಹೊರಗಡೆ ಬರ್ತದೆ ಆದ್ರೆ ಒಂದು ವಿಷಯ ಏನಂತ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಈಗ ನಮ್ಮ ಉದಾಹರಣೆಗೆ ನಮ್ಮ ರಾಮನಗರಗಳು ಸೊ ಇದು ನಮ್ಮ ರಾಮನಗರದ ಒಂದು ಮ್ಯಾಪ್ ನೋಡಿ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಈ ಕಡೆ ಕೆಳಭಾಗದಲ್ಲಿ ಬನ್ನೇರಘಟ್ಟ ನೋಡಿ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಬನ್ನೇರಘಟ್ಟ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಆ ಈ ಸಣ್ಣ ಸಣ್ಣ ಪ್ಯಾಚಸ್ ಬನ್ನೇರಘಟ್ಟ ಈ ಕಡೆ ಇರೋದು ನಮ್ಮ ಕಾವೇರಿ ಇದು ಸೊ ಇಲ್ಲೇನಾಗಿದೆ ಅಂತಂದ್ರೆ ಈ ನಮ್ದು ಬನ್ನೇರಘಟ್ಟದಲ್ಲಿ ಮತ್ತೆ ಕಾವೇರಿ ನಲ್ಲಿ ನಮ್ಮ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಪಾಪ್ಯುಲೇಷನ್ ನೋಡಿದಾಗ ಕಾವೇರಿ ನಲ್ಲಿ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಒಂದು ಮುನ್ನೂರು ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಇದೆ ಅಂತ ಸುಮ್ಮನೆ ಅನ್ಕೊಳ್ಳಿ ಮುನ್ನೂರ್ ಅಂತೂ ಇದೆ ಇದೆ ಪಾಪ್ಯುಲೇಷನ್ ಬನ್ನೇರಘಟ್ಟದಲ್ಲಿ ಒಂದು ಇನ್ನೂರು ಇದೆ ಅಂತ ಅನ್ಕೊಳ್ತೀವಿ ಸೊ ಟೋಟಲ್ ಐನೂರು ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಅಂತೂ ಆ ಸುತ್ತಮುತ್ತ ಇದೆ ಅದರೊಳಗೊಂದು ಅರ್ಧ
ಸೊ ಬರ್ಬೇಕಾದ್ರೆ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಬರ್ಬೇಕಾದ್ರೆ ಒಂದ್ ಮೂರ್ ನಾಲ್ಕು ಜನ ಬರ್ತಾರೆ ಇವ್ ಮೂರ್ ನಾಲ್ಕು ಜನ ವಾಪಸ್ ಹೋಗಿ ಹಾಕಿದ್ರೆ ಇನ್ನೊಬ್ಬ ಸರ್ಕೊತಾನೆ ಪರವಾಗಿಲ್ಲ ನಾನು ಹೋಗ್ಬೋದು ಅಂತ ಅನ್ಕೊಂಡು ಅದು ಹೋಗ್ಬೋದು ಸೊ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಅವ್ ಈ ಯಂಗ್ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಎಸ್ಪೆಷಲಿ ಯಂಗ್ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಮೇಲ್ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ನಮ್ಮ ಏನು ನಮ್ಮ ಏನು ಮೇಜರ್ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಆನಿಮಲ್ ಕಾನ್ಫ್ಲಿಕ್ಟ್ಗೆ ಕೊಡುವಂತ ಒಂದು ತೊಂದರೆ ಕೊಡುವಂತ ಒಂದು ಅಂಶ ಬಹಳ ರೇರ್ ಆಗಿ ಪೆಣ್ಣಾಯಿಗಳು ಬರ್ತವೆ ಕೆಲಸ ಅದೇ ತುಂಬಾ ಫ್ರೀಡಮ್ ಆಗುದಿಲ್ಲ ಪರವಾಗಿಲ್ಲ ಓಡ್ಬೇಕು ಸೊ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ನೀವು ನೋಡಿದ್ರೆ ಇದು ಯಾವ ಒಂದು ಸುಮ್ಮನೆ ಯೂಶಲಿ ನಮ್ಮ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಆನಿಮಲ್ ಕಾನ್ಫ್ಲಿಕ್ಟ್ ಆಗಿ ಎಲ್ಲಾ ಕಡೆ ಇದೆ ಸೊ ಐ ಟೇಕನ್ ರಾಮ್ ನಗರ್ ಫಾರ್ ಎಕ್ಸಾಂಪಲ್ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಎಂತ ಸಿಚುವೇಶನ್ ಅಂತ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಸುತ್ತ ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಕಾಡಿದೆ ಆ ರೆಡ್ ಮಾರ್ಕ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಇರೋದ್ರಲ್ಲಿ ರಾಮ್ ನಗರ ದೂರದಲ್ಲಿರುವಂತ ಸಣ್ಣ ಸಣ್ಣ ಕಾಡು ರಾಮ್ ನಗರ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿಕ್ಟ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಇರುವಂತ ಸಣ್ಣ ಸಣ್ಣ ಕಾಡು ಈ ದೊಡ್ಡ ಕಾಡುಗಳಿಂದ ಈ ಕೆಳಗಡೆ ಕಾಡಿದೆ ಈ ದೊಡ್ಡ ಕಾಡುಗಳಿಂದ ಆನೆಗಳು ಒಂದು ನಾವು ಹೇಳಿದ್ರು ಒಂದು ಇಪ್ಪತ್ತರಿಂದ ಇಪ್ಪತ್ತೈದು ಆನೆ ಬರ್ತವೆ ಹಗಲತ್ತಲ್ಲಿ ಆ ಸಣ್ಣ ಸಣ್ಣ ಕಾಡುಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಅಡಕೊಳ್ತವೆ ರಾತ್ರಿ ಬರ್ತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಕ್ರಾಪ್ ರೈಡ್ ಎಂತ ಕ್ರಾಪ್ ರೈಡ್ ಅಂತ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಈಗ ನಮ್ಗೆ ದೂರದಿಂದ ನೋಡೋದು ಬಹಳ ಚಂದ ಏನು ಆನೆಗಳಿರ್ಬೇಕು ಒಂದ ಪ್ರಾಣಿಗಳಿರ್ಬೇಕು ಆಪರೇಷನ್ ಇದ್ರೆ ಒಳ್ಳೆಯದು ನೋಡೋದು ತುಂಬಾ ಚಂದ ಅದೇ ಒಬ್ಬ ರೈತನ ದೃಷ್ಟಿಯಿಂದ ಯೋಚನೆ ಮಾಡುತ್ತೆ ಅವನು ವರ್ಷದಲ್ಲಿ ಕಷ್ಟಪಟ್ಟು ಬೆಳೆದಂತ ನೋಡಿ ಹೌದು ಡೆವಾಸ್ಟೇಟಿಂಗ್ ಇಟೀಸ್ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಸಂಪೂರ್ಣವಾದ ನಾಶ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಸೊ ರೈತ ಏನ್ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕು ಅವನು ಫುಡ್ ಏನ್ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕು ಸೊ ಈ ತರದ ಪರಿಸ್ಥಿತಿ ತಂದಿದೆ ಸೊ ನಮ್ಗೆ ಹೊರಗಡೆಯಿಂದ ಕಂಡಾಗ ಒಂದು ವನ್ಯಪ್ರಾಣಿ ಮತ್ತೆ ಇದು ಬಹಳ ಸುಂದರ ಅನ್ಸಿದ್ರು ಕೂಡ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಹೊರಗಡೆ ಹೋಗಿ ನೋಡಿದಾಗ ಅವನು ಮುಂದೆ ಏನು ನಾವು ಕೂಡ ನಾವು ಕಾಂಪನ್ಸೇಷನ್ ಅಂತ ಕೊಡ್ತೀವಿ ಪ್ರಿಲಿಸ್ ಮಾರ್ ಕಾಂಪನ್ಸೇಷನ್ ಅದು ಕಾಂಪನ್ಸೇಷನ್ ಆಗಿ ಹೋಗ್ಬೋದು ಪರಿಹಾರ ಆಗಿ ಹೋಗ್ಬೋದು ಆದ್ರೆ ರೈತನ ಪರಿಸ್ಥಿತಿ ಏನು ನೋಡಿ ಅದ್ರ ಜೊತೆ ಒಳಗೆ ಆನೆ ಕೂಡ ಕೆಲವು ರೈತರು ಏನಾಗ್ತಾರೆ ರೋಸ್ ಹೋಗ್ತಾರೆ ಆನೆಗೆ ವಿದ್ಯುತ್ ಸ್ಪರ್ಶ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಈಗ ಕೋಚಿಂಗ್ ಆಗ್ತಾ ಇಲ್ಲ ನಮ್ಗೆ ಈ ತರ ಎಲೆಕ್ಟ್ರಿಕೇಶನ್ ಆಗಿ ಆನೆಗಳು ನೋಡಿ ಇದೊಂದು ಇದ್ರಲ್ಲಿ ಆನೆ ಇಡೀ ತಾಳ್ದೇಟ ನೋಡಿ ಈ ಹುಡುಗ ಅವನ ಅವನ ಜಮೀನ್ ಹತ್ರನೇ ಇದು ಸತ್ತೋಗಿತ್ತು ಕ್ರಾಪ್ ರೈಡ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಸತ್ತೋಗಿತ್ತು ಆದ್ರೂ ಎಲ್ಲೋ ಒಂದ್ ಕಡೆ ಒಂದು ಮಾನವ ಮುಖ ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಒಂದು ಪೋಸ್ಟರ್ ಹಾಕ್ತಾನೆ ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಒಂದು ಪೋಸ್ಟರ್ ಹಾಕಿ ಒಂದು ಇದನ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಗಜಾನನ ಇಷ್ಟ ತಾರೀಕು ಸತ್ತೋಯ್ತು ಇಷ್ಟ ತಾರೀಕು ಇದನ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಆತರ ಕೂಡ ಕೆಲವೊಂದ್ ಕಡೆ ಆ ಗಣೇಶನ್ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಈಗಲೂ ಕೂಡ ನಾವು ಎಸ್ಪೆಷಲಿ ಅಡಬ್ರು ಇದಾರಲ್ಲ ನೀವು ಎಸ್ಪೆಷಲಿ ಬಂಡ ಬಂಡಿಪುರಿ ಸುತ್ತಮುತ್ತ ಹಳೆ ಅಥವಾ ಕನಕ್ಪುರ ಸುತ್ತಮುತ್ತ ಹಳೆ ಆನೆಗಳು ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಬಹಳ ವರ್ಷದಿಂದ ಆನೆ ಇರೋ ಕಡೆ ಜನಗಳು ಏನ್ ಹೇಳ್ತಾರೆ ಇವಾಗ ಕಾಂಪನ್ಸೇಷನ್ ಇದಾರ ಗಣೇಶ ಇತ್ತಂದ್ರೆ ಬಂದು ಬೈಕೊಂಡು ಹೋಗಿ ಅಂತ ಕೂಡ ಜನಗಳು ಇವತ್ತು ಕೂಡ ಇದಾರೆ ಸೊ ಇದು ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಇದ್ರ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ನೋಡಿ ಈಗ ವಾಟ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಎಷ್ಟ ನಾವ್ ಏನ್ ಮಾಡೋದು ಪ್ರಯತ್ನ ಸೊ ಇದು ರೈಲ್ವೆ ಬ್ಯಾರಿಕೇಡ್ ಸೊ ನಾವು ಮುಂಚೆ ಇ ಪಿ ಟಿ ಮಾಡಿದ್ವಿ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಪ್ರೂಫ್ ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್ಸ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ವಿ ಅದನ್ನ ಮ್ಯಾನ್ ಓವರ್ ಮಾಡೋದಕ್ಕೆ ಹೋಗ್ತಾರೆ ನಾವು ಹೇಳಿದ ಅವಾಗ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಟೆಲಿಜೆಂಟ್ ಅನಿಮಲ್ಸ್ ಅದನ್ನ ಮ್ಯಾನ್ ಓವರ್ ಮಾಡೋದಕ್ಕೆ ಹೋಗ್ತಾರೆ ಸೋಲಾರ್ ಫೆನ್ಸ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ವಿ ಸುಮಾರು ಕೆಲವು ಸರಿ ವಿಡಿಯೋಗಳು ನೀವು ನೋಡಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಸೋಲಾರ್ ಫೆನ್ಸ್ ಒಳಗಡೆ ಒಂದ್ ಮರ ಎತ್ತ ಹಾಕ್ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಸೋಲಾರ್ ಫೆನ್ಸ್ ನ ನಲ್ಲಿಫೈ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಂಡು ದಾಟ್ಕೊಂಡು ಹೋಗ್ತಾರೆ ಈ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಬ್ಯಾರಿಯರ್ ಏನಿದೆ ಇದನ್ನು ಕೂಡ ದಾಟ್ಕೊಂಡು
the small animals they can move to any barricade out of the river they can go there so idanna now manor madala atho idanna try madodu bala kashta enagide illi ee usually nam main martivi yavo on kade chirte attack aagutte ichcha ee tara poor gulna ittukko adakke one naaye matte kelutte one break ittukko aa chirte gulna ಒಳಗಡೆ ಫೋನ್ ಒಳಗಡೆ ಬರೋ ತರ ಮಾಡಿ ಕ್ಯಾಮೋಫ್ಲೇಜ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಅದನ್ನ ಕರ್ಕೊಂಡು ಹೋಗಿ ಕಾರ್ಗ ಹೊರಗಡೆ ಸೊ ಇಲ್ಲೂ ಕೂಡ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಡೆತ್ಸ್ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ ಇದ್ರೂ ಕೂಡ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಡೆತ್ಸ್ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಸೊ ಇಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಬಿಕಮ್ ವೆರಿ ಚಾಲೆಂಜಿಂಗ್ ಟಾಸ್ಕ್ ಇದೇ ತರ ಹುಲಿ ಕೂಡ ಅಷ್ಟೆ ಹುಲಿ ಕೂಡ ನೀವು ಸುಮಾರು ಕಡೆ ಪೇಪರ್ ಓದಿರ್ತೀರಿ ನಾಡುಗಳಿಂದ ಹುಲಿ ಬಂತು ಪ್ಯಾನಿಟೈಸ್ ಆಯ್ತು ಹಾಗೆ ಖುಷಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಈ ಚಿಂತೆ ಹುಲಿ ಏನಂತಂದ್ರೆ ಸಾಮಾನ್ಯವಾಗಿ ಅದು ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿದ್ದಾಗ ಎಲ್ಪ್ ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿದ್ದಾಗ ಅದ್ರ ಪಾಡ್ಗಳ ಆಹಾರ ತಗೊಳಕ್ ಇಷ್ಟ ಇದು ಕಷ್ಟ ಆಗದೆ ಇದ್ದಾಗ ಅಷ್ಟು ಸುಲಭ ಆಗಿ ಇದೇನು ಮನುಷ್ಯರ ಬರಲ್ಲ ಹೊರಗಡೆ ಬರಲ್ಲ ಏಜ್ ಆದ್ಮೇಲೆ ಅಲ್ಲೂ ಮೌಳಿಗಳು ತಗೊಂಡಿದ್ದಾದ್ಮೇಲೆ ಅದ್ರ ಬಂದ್ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಯಾವ್ದೇ ಒಂದು ಪ್ರಾಣಿನ ಆ ಹಸು ಯಾಕಂದ್ರೆ ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಜಿಂಕೆನೆಲ್ಲ ಹಿಡಿಯೋದಕ್ಕಾಗಲ್ಲ ಈ ಹಸು ಪಶು ಅಂತವ್ರು ಹಿಡಿಯೋದಕ್ ಬಂದಾಗ ಆಕಸ್ಮಿಕವಾಗಿ ಮನುಷ್ಯ ಏನಾದ್ರೆ ಇಟ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿಕಮ್ ಮ್ಯಾನ್ ಇಟರ್ ಅಂತ ಅಂದ್ಕೊಂತೀವಿ ಸೊ ಅದನ್ನ ಕೂಡ ನಾವು ಮ್ಯಾನೇಜ್ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕಾಗಿದ್ರು ತುಂಬಾ ಇದೆ ಅದೇ ಅವಾಗ ಹೇಳ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಸೊ ಈ ತರ ರೈತನ ಜಮೀನನ್ನ ನಾಶ ಮಾಡ್ತೇವೆ ಇದನ್ನ ಸೊ ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ನಾವು ಸಾಕಷ್ಟು ಕ್ರಮಗಳನ್ನು ಕೂಡ ಕೈಗೊಳ್ತೀವಿ ನೋಡಿ ಎಷ್ಟು ಯಾವ ರೀತಿ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದಿ ಕಾಂಪನ್ಸೇಷನ್ ತ್ರೀ ನೈಂಟಿ ಒನ್ ಲ್ಯಾಕ್ಸ್ ಒಂದು ವರ್ಷದಲ್ಲಿ ಕೊಟ್ಟಿರುವಂತಹ ಕಾಂಪನ್ಸೇಷನ್ ಮೂರು ಕೋಟಿ ಒಂಬತ್ತು ಲಕ್ಷ ಕಾಂಪನ್ಸೇಷನ್ ಅದು ರಾಮನಗರ ಒಂದ್ರಲ್ಲ ಅದೇ ರೀತಿ ನೀವು ಎಲ್ಲ ಕೇಳ್ಕೊಂಡೋದ್ರೆ ಸುಮಾರು ಒಂದು ಮೂವತ್ತರಿಂದ ನಲವತ್ತು ಕೋಟಿ ಅಷ್ಟು ಕಾಂಪನ್ಸೇಷನ್ ಬರ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಸೊ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಇದು ಇನ್ನು ಮುಂದೆ ಕೂಡ ಸಾಕಷ್ಟು ಚಾಲೆಂಜಿಂಗ್ ಇದೆ ಈ ಮಗಿಲ್ಗಳು ಬರ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಹೊಸ ಇದು ಕಾರ್ಡ್ ಅಂಗಡಿಗಳು ಸೊ ದೀಸ್ ಆರ್ ದಿ ಚಾಲೆಂಜಸ್ for the new days to come. So, I'm just to Akasha Kutu. I'm going to do it. 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 Black Club or Progeny is going to do it. Black Club product, it is more of a new one. I think you can tell better at least. Uh, the system is in the system. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. It is actually dominantly in the that, that, that color. Oh. What we are seeing the brownish color in the color. So, the rest of the system is in the color. I think it is common. We are not the same as 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 the same. Good afternoon all. Uh, it's my privilege to welcome and uh, our Sir Edu Kundlo, uh, IFS, who is currently serving as a Deputy Conservator of Forest, Mali Mahadeshwara Wildlife Division Kolegala. And uh, he graduated from uh, Batla University, Andhra Pradesh, and his post-graduation is in agriculture from Dawad University, Karnataka. Uh, he has a tagline, anything can wait, but not conservation. Uh, currently, he is serving as a Deputy Conservator of Forest. Uh, he has served as Deputy Conservator of Forest in Mysore Wildlife Division. He has encouraged the farmers for community farming. He is like, famously known as People's Forest Officer. So his best programs are Chengri Village Relocation Program, he has worked more for farmers and he has conducted three plastic cleaning drive in MM Hills. He has produced a short awareness movie on elephants, uh, that is Gacha. 
So by this words, I would request Edi Kundala Vadu sir to deliver his talk on application of genetics in wildlife conservation and management. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Madam, for the generous introduction. Uh, respected uh, Professor Malini, Madam, and uh, all esteemed uh, professors, dignitaries, and uh, my dear students. Uh, uh, Professor Mathur, sir, his uh, talk. I told about almost everything about the vultures from starting uh, demographics to uh, decline to uh, recovery and breeding programs. And, uh, and there was um, a very informative uh, lecture on the man animal conflict, uh, all the practical problems faced by the forest department. Uh, now, I will quickly go through the uh, some slides regarding the uh, genetics application on uh, wildlife conservation and management. Now, I will go the Recently, we have seen this news. Uh, vultures get a new home in Namagand. And then, uh, as uh, Mathur sir said, uh, now, we will be having the uh, vulture breeding program in the Banyarbeta uh, National Park uh, in June. And around uh, 20, uh, 10, 10 vultures are coming from the uh, Pinjur uh, breeding center. So, in this background, uh, in Karnataka uh, and in, even in India also, we have the uh, breeding program recovery program, but uh, uh, as uh, even uh, Mathur Sar was also telling, not too much uh, uh, recovery programs at the uh, world level or the international level levels are happening. We, we, we know that uh, uh, diversity at the genetic species and ecosystem level, but now our recovery program only, uh, our central goal is the genetic diversity. So, the main goal of the conservation genetics is to apply the genetics to the reduce the extinction uh, of the any animal because of the small populations, because of the so many reasons. Uh, the, the, for this, for at least for the vulture uh, diclofenac problem. Uh, so, how to use the genetics for the recovery programs? We know the conservation biodiversity need for because uh, genetics is generally ignored topic because uh, wildlife managers work one side and the uh, genetic department works uh, some other side. Even, but lot of the problems also there because the nine, the rate of extinction is very, very high so that we need not now wait. We need immediately take this subject into consideration for the breeding programs. Uh, many species are going extinct even before they are discovered and uh, described. Uh, if you can see the uh, rate of the... Okay. Uh, uh, so, of course, extension is a natural evolutionary process by which uh, we all know the speciation will work. Uh, this happens last earlier uh, five uh, extinction uh, cycles, but the current rate at which species are lost are out out runs the that of the speciation. That means the this uh, sixth sixth extinction and the great extinction and what we what we are calling 
uh, that is uh, we can see the from the 18th uh, 19th century all the uh, extension of the all the working plants everything is happening uh, uh, Sorry. Uh, as we know that major issues in uh, conservation biology we are interested uh, issues are the uh, inbreeding depression lo loss of genetic diversity and adaptive potential population fragmentation and loss of gene flow genetic drift accumulation of the deleterious mutations adaptation to captivity and the consequences of the captive breeding and reintroduction taxonomic uncertainties those are masking the true biodiversity or creation of the false biodiversity uh, defining the esus uh, evolutionary significant units and uh, management within the populations uh, forensic analysis and understanding of the species biology and about breeding depressions Uh, these subjects are very very important in the uh, genetics as we all know that uh, conservation biology is a interdisciplinary subject which requires the everything from physiology to biogeography to the uh, genomics to the social science and veterinary and human science as we know the conserv in conservation genetics uh conservation genetics applies the principles of the genetics that can cope with the environmental changes so one important and constant factor facing the world wide diversity is the environmental change so once this uh, uh genetics when it is tested with the environment we are facing with the adoption problem we are facing with the uh, uh, maintenance of the biodiversity and yeah we know that 99% of the species that have ever lived are now extinct so genetic diversity is the building block for the higher level of the biodiversity that we uh, discussed and it is a subject for the uh, conservation breeding uh we know that genetic variation and diversity genetic difference uh variation is the differences that occur in uh, restricted gene flow between the population uh so uh, genetic variation is the variety of the alleles and genotypes present in the population so yeah we know that this variation is present everywhere uh like the finches of the galapagos islands uh from the beach to the eye color to the uh, uh this variation from the functional point of the genetic diverse diversity can be classified as the neutral or deleterious or the adaptive so neutral variants are used for the conservation because the deleterious and adaptive a uh, variation we have already they, they are expressed and and it is test, uh, tested by the uh, environment is already because this is the uh, neutral variants or the uh, variation is the uh, a kind of the uh, gene bank for us for the future uh, uh, this one genetic variation and diversity depends upon the levels of the gene flow between the, and among the populations uh genetic variation as we know that uh, uh, it will depend upon the various uh, factors like uh, uh, barriers uh, so the degree of the differentiation among the population is usually greater for the species with the low migration because if migration if connectivity is there the differentiation will be less and uh, uh, the populations will become homogeneous, uh, homogeneous uh, ultimately so differentiation is also expected to be greater for the subdivided have uh, so that means that uh, barriers um, 
we uh, quantitative genetic variation is the basis for the phenotypic traits and therefore the greater concern for the uh, conservation biology most population of the endangered species are commonly subdivided into the different breeding groups uh, and either different fragments of the habitats natural reserves or the arboreta or zoos which in turn divide into smaller reproductive to more or less are interconnected so as we know this uh, um, uh, barrier with the in elevated variation uh, barrier is the main reason for the speciation and uh, partial spatial isolation in the parametric where the barrier is slightly um, slightly a factor in sympatric is barrier is not factor and uh, genetic polymerism will be there within the uh, population and the peripatric is the uh, a small migration uh, edge of the population is the uh, factor for the this one uh, as we know that uh, population it come to the population genetics uh, they are the species living together and interact sexually and produce the offspring in population genetics uh, three important goals we have to explain the origin and maintenance of the genetic variation of the wild population to explain the pattern and the organization of the genetic variation to understand the mechanisms uh, that cause this allelic factor uh, allelic frequencies so population genetics we know it, 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 it is also an interdisciplinary subject uh, genetics to genomics to evolution the way of the computational way of systematics plant breeding animal breeding and the, so many inter, it is an interdisciplinary subject in wildlife management in population population genetics we are interested in identifying the population size and the demographic history of the particular uh, species which are uh, uh, important for the ocean uh, or the problematic population assessing the population structure and the connectivity uh, detecting the hybridization and admixtures assessing the potential of the population to persist and adapt to the environmental change and understanding of the factors that affect the potential these are the important population uh, uh, parameters for the uh, evaluation uh, um genetic biology as we know the uh, gene flow uh, and genetic structure is and the genetic differential result of the natural process like uh, migration genetic drift and natural selection and historical events and uh, genetic structure is provide as a platform to evaluate the level of inbreeding and its possible impact on biodiversity the structure information is also important for the understanding of the how disease may spread among the uh, wild population studies of the structures and differentiation usually focus on isolated and partially isolated small populations where evaluation reports such as the founder effect drift inbreeding and selections are expected to cause the changes however in continuous landscapes uh, environmental differences are the uh, main reason for the uh, structure of the population <clears throat> so this gene flow is uh, suggest that ecological process may strongly influence the amount of the gene flow among the population they therefore subject the natal habitat bias dispersal in the underlying mechanism linking the population ecology with population genetic structure if you can see the here a barrier uh, two population one is the population a with the um, um, selection pressure is against the recessive phenotype has been created at a homogeneous population ww hh and here the um, 
population B selection pressure against the dominant phenotype is uh, created a homogeneous population here. So, uh, uh, molecular biology is application of the molecular genetic methods for the ecological questions. The emergence of this field of studies depends upon the systematic evolutionary theory, genetics and the behavioral history. In molecular biology, we go a step ahead with the biochemistry level and uh, it, its uh, uh, gene expression at the uh, field level. So, the subject of the ecology itself is study the interaction between the organisms and its, its physical environment to bring about the phenotypic expressions at the field level. This gives rise to the array of phenotypic data based on the one or more aspects of the organism's biochemistry, behavior, morphology and uh, physiology. But the phenotypic data we have very limited. That's why the potential of the single genotype type to develop into a multiple alternative phenotypes under different environmental conditions. Phenotypic plasticity, plasticity is a major shortfall here. So, for overcoming that, we use the all molecular markers uh, for the quantification of the genetic diversity, tracking of the gene flow, and the measurement of inbreeding, identification of the individuals and population new species differentiation, retracting historical patterns of the dispersal, resolution of the population structures, resolution of the taxonomic uncertainties and detection of the aggregation and the wildlife for insects. Uh, as we all know, the tools for the genetic variability and the molecular tests are the RFLB, many RAPD, SSLB, microsatellite, uh, mini satellite, uh, SNPs, DNA and RNA sequencing, DNA fingerprinting, retroporosis and chromosome analysis uh, we do in for the uh, genetic analysis. But uh, limitations we have for the um, genetic uh, level. Uh, for genome, uh, genome sequence, we have a limitation in allele frequency. For large phenotypic collection, we have limitation in description of the phenotypes. The large sample size, we have the uh, uh, field condition of the workability. Mitochondrial and SNPs, we have the uh, limited to only autosomal SNPs. Multivariant analysis, we have the uh, ignoring of the pleiotropy uh, issue. So, this is how we have the. So, when come to the applications in uh, wildlife conservation, uh, identifying the population unit is the one of the application. So, in uh, identify, identifying the population units, suppose in this island we have the one, two, three, three populations are there in that we, we need to identify and delineate delay the boundaries of the uh, population, inter, interspecific conservation units, ICUs, these are the ICU1, ICU2, ICU3 and uh, uh, we have the evolutionary significant units, uh, ECUs uh, and we have the management units within the ECUs. Uh, ECU is a classification of the populations that have the substantial reproductive isolation and uh, adaptive differences so that the population represents a significant evolutionary component in this species. Management unit is a local population that is managed as a separate unit because of demographic independence. Suppose here, uh, two ICUs, we have the one management unit, two management These two are the demographically independent units. So, uh, identifying of the population units for the Wildlife studies are very important. So, we have the genetic monitoring, monitoring of the uh, deleterious variants such as those that cause inbreeding depression and also information to detect the genomic erosion in small population. So, if monitoring reveals that genetic problems are accumulating, 
or that populations are not showing any adaptive response to the environmental stressors manager will will take that that population requires active management strategies so or otherwise we can say that monitoring the yield variation at particular low say which can inform the managers on whether the evolutionary rescue is possible or required immediately third one is assisted gene flow or the genetic rescue or the translocation uh, as we know that the wildlife populations are in increasing isolated and uh, uh, they have the loss of genetic var uh, variation so genetic rescue is a is increase in the population fitness and decrease in extinction probability by three way one is the if, uh, to identify the population suffering from the low genetic variation and inbreeding depression uh, and map of the low variation across the uh, um, across the genome to identify the best potential source populations and uh, and if when the genetic rescue is implemented genomic data can be used to monitor mo monitoring the changes in the genetic ancestor across the loci fourth one is managing for this specific genetic variants for threatened and declining population a major concern is that adaptive alleles that might be lost by environmental stress caused by the humans so management strategies with the genetic monitoring could be designed to maintain the variation at that particular low site so executive management uh, we know that uh, in uh, in captivity some uh, um, this captive population represent the majority of the genetic variation actually these captive populations act as the uh, gene banks for us Uh, for the future recovery programs uh, methods to estimate the demographic history source population admixtures can much reveal much about the captive individuals so some of the genetic exploits uh, already done at the um, management level suppose uh, 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 ivory ivory tusk recovery origin origin is discovered uh, discovered from the elephants uh, reported by the 2000 by the vasareta estimation of the population study on elephant and grey wolf uh, done by mowat and uh, stoback 2000 and genetic diversity and gene flow on grey wolf and uh, brown bears and elephants detecting hybridization in uh, red wolf <laughs> evaluating the social structure in chimpanzees and uh, rhinoceros 2001 predator uh, identification of predator identification kills in coyote and dingo was done in the farer and dingo in this molecular techniques after the discovery of the pcr techniques it is um, the genetics molecular level is revolutionized this is even very small number of the sample can be used for the conservation genetics even very poor quality samples or otherwise non invasive uh, samples like uh, hair urine and uh, uh, fecal matter regurgitates egg shells saliva and uh, uh, skin is also used for the uh, um, dna collection uh, challenges of the uh, genetic Uh, genetic tools as we know that uh, uh, in the recovery prog uh, pro um, programs uh, if the founder population is uh, very low we we are having the problem of the very poor adaptation and we have the inbreeding depressions uh, in, in case if we have the very small population ultimately we may have to depend upon mutations for the variants uh we all know that the cost of conducting research is uh, is very high so devising the low cost genome sequencing regime is also very very important uh, we know that uh, uh, till now knowledge of the genetics have aided conservation the routine extension some of the recovery programs uh, 
Um, earlier we told genetic loss and uh, minimizing inbreeding depression by identifying the profiling, gene profiling and uh, gene mapping. Uh, identifying the populations and population units, units for the conservation in cancer. Resolve, resolving the population structures and resolving the taxonomic uncertainties of, or, or otherwise uh, false variability or the diversity. Refining the management units within the species, uh, detecting uh, hybridization, defining sites for the reintroduction where the um, uh, adaptability and the location is very important, choosing the best population for the uh, uh, reintroductions and uh, forensic applications uh, also we have seen. Uh, uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, yeah, uh, any any question not related to this, please ask. <laughs> so, of course, I am simply joking. So, any even for the wildlife purpose also, in general also. Any questions? Dr. Mathur, sir, you have nicely, I mean, uh, definitely highlighted the basic principles of genetics in the application of wildlife management. Nice, sir. But uh, in the wildlife population, generally, you know, they are the outcome of the inbreeding, right? The, the consequence of inbreeding, we know the deterioration and the qualitative and quantitative rights. Probably, is it uh, this inbreeding is affecting the wildlife population now in the present day, sir? As we know, that inbreeding is a problem with the uh, very small populations, um, like. Uh, if it's a population size like vultures, uh, that's why we require the um, genetic mapping of the uh, all the um, pedigree analysis. So in in, in breeding, uh, uh, at least in recovery programs, uh, if pedigree is not clearly done. Suppose, I don't know whether in that uh, Pinjor uh, population uh, is sufficient or not. I, do, I, I don't know. If, if population is not sufficient, definitely inbreeding depression is, will come and ultimately uh, 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 <clears throat> loss of the biodiversity and the adaptability will definitely affect. Sir. But in wild populations, as we know, um, in, in the vultures, uh, they have conducted the they have conducted the research on vultures. Uh, all these Indian species, uh, gyps, uh, Bengalensis, and uh, they have very um, strong genetic uh, variability base. Uh, so inbreeding depression at the in wild wild populations are not much problem. Uh, inbreeding depression at the the managed populations are the main problems. Can I add something? <coughs> you see, in breeding also, it becomes a problem in fragmented populations. Yes, sir. See, if you look, for example, we conducted extensive studies on the lion-tailed monkeys. Yes, sir. See, the lion-tailed monkeys are there in Western Ghats in Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and Kerala. So we selected, we got the samples from almost throughout the range. Yes. The, for the genetic analysis. And we published series, especially in uh, PLOS, PLOS 1 and the journals. No, first of all, we found two populations genetically different. Separated about 11 million years ago, one is north of Palghat Gap and one is south, Pal south of Palghat Gap. Sir. For example, what we have in Joe Paul and these populations of Kukur is very different from Anamalai Tiger Reserve and uh, these. So what it has implication genetically for management now is that there, there have to be two different populations under captivity also. So what we did, we took genetic samples from Mysore Zoo, then uh, Wandalur Zoo, uh, Chennai, and uh, Trivandrum. We have three lion-tailed macaque populations, good ones. And interestingly, the Mysore population of lion-tailed monkeys here belongs to the northern, north of uh, Palghat Gap. Yes. And both Wandalur and uh, Trivandrum, they are all animals from uh, the south. Yes, but what had happened was that one monkey in Mysore, one male, we found that it has a southern genotype. So immediately I told the zoo director, please shift this monkey so that the population should not be mixed. So that monkey was sent back to Chennai. So these are the kind of uh, management implications. And then 
we have these lantern gas population and anomaly tiger reserve you know anomaly tiger reserve is yes. a very unique situation because that about 190 square kilometers of uh, tea plantations so there are lots of uh, small fragments ranging from like pudutottam for example have 96 monkeys in less than 1 square kilometer so we took genetic sample people sample from all of those fragments yes sir you know first thing we found was that in forest fragments as compared to the larger populations like uh, varagaliya anagurti where you have silent valley for example where there is a large area available there is a depleted mitochondria diversity in forest fragments the first finding okay, and we did only mitochondrial diversity and then we found that one haplotype was totally lost in uh, some of the fragmented populations so there is the effect of uh, you know this isolation in animals for example lighted muka you won't find this in nilgiri langurs because they can make use of uh, roadside trees so dispersal is there automatically gene flow is there but lighted muka never use make use of deciduous forest you won't find them on the road sides so they remain isolated yes, the same way for example uh, you take uh, squirrels yes, the indian giant squirrel will not be affected genetically because there you, you go on uti road for example you can find them all over yes sir. but the flying squirrel you won't because if there is a forest fragment the flying squirrel need very tall trees then they have to glide yes. so if those which are in you know forest fragments so they are genetically highly affected the the flying squirrels where the giant squirrels are not because we have taken samples from giant squirrels all over so you see that the diversity loss is not there so these are some of the very important implications for the white tech managers both yes. in captivity as well as uh, in the white situations so where we have to sort of keep collaborating with the people who do molecular biology work and then find the application for our management in the forest yes sir yes sir really yes, thank you uh, very much to all sir uh, you are very much involved in tiger conservation is it genetic profiling or do you plan for the tiger conservation madam i i don't know whether the um, what is the question regarding the tiger genetic profile for tiger conservation genetic profiling for tiger conservation well, it's been done long time with ccmp the you know lakons lab that laboratory for the conservation of endangered species in hyderabad it's one of the big labs of ccmp so dr lalji singh started it long time ago and the now we are also involved i am also involved in it now dr uma pati who is my former uh, he was with us here he was my former uh, post doc so lot of the uh, you know work is being done now and anuradha reddy she has uh, finished the phd thesis just now i was her examiner actually so she took from panna and from that also work jadu uh, andru is very interesting about uh, isolation and uh, how tigers actually are using which kind of landscape how effective was that information huh? how effective was that oh, it's very 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 good work very effective so lot of uh, genetic work is being used now for the conservation of tigers also it was used for lions for example you know the lions which we had in india they were all mixed i mean african and asian it took 15 years actually to isolate and to find out real uh, the asiatic ones yeah tiger profiling is done almost half of the country now so okay once again i'd like to talk, thank mr ridu kundal for the great talk about the use of molecular biology techniques and genetics in uh, conservation in our ecology and biodiversity conservation so thank you and with that i think we'll end the event now uh thank you for everybody patiently being here and being part of this event thank you once again